Okay, good morning. How is everyone doing? Can everyone hear my voice? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for joining the last lecture of uh, Dr. Hyder's step one for this week. Um, and this week we have been trying to cover neurology for a long period of time and we have made quite a big of dent in finishing neurology. And um, hopefully by uh, the next week, we will be done with our neurology and then we will be moving forward. And uh, having said that, we will be finishing an extremely big portion of first aid. And um, according to uh, our promise, uh, we said that we would be finishing first aid in three months and looks like that we are on the right path. Okay. And um, with that being said, um, how is your U world solving going? How, how many questions are you guys doing every day? How is U world going? Okay, so 25 questions, that's not bad. Anyone else? Forty to sixty questions. Okay. Okay. So um, regarding the videos, so we have a lot of students who has been asking for videos, and uh, we know that uh, some of the videos have got deleted from the Zoom. And the reason being is because we have to provide uh, space, extra space, in order for us to, in order for us to keep on recording. But the good news is uh, the videos are saved, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. We will send you the videos, uh, the videos which you have wanted. I know a lot of you guys have been asking for the videos for a long period of time, but we have been going through some troubles of our own. And we are trying our utmost best to, um, to upload the videos. The problem is, uh, the problem is um, it's just taking a while because uh, we are trying to organize the lectures accordingly. But if we cannot finish um, organizing the lectures, what we would be doing is we would be sending the videos right away via email. So uh, thank you so much for having so much patience. And hopefully by the end of uh, today's lectures and uh, before the beginning of uh, tomorrow, you would be having the videos in your email account. Okay. So I um, just wanted to clear that out. Okay, with that being said, um, how many uh, questions in your U world did you guys did you guys get in common to our discussion? Okay, anyone else? Okay, so uh, we have a question from Dr. Hassan. So uh, um, any suggestions on how to take your work notes? I can the explanation part, there are lots of stuff given. Um, when answers are right or wrong, do I know all of these? I'm struggling. To... Okay, so okay, so this is a very good question. So we have one question from one of our physicians over here. Um, her question is, how should one uh, do a proper notes of the UO? Okay, so first and foremost, uh, the best way to take UWorld notes for step one, okay, the best way to take UWorld notes for step one is when you are solving UWorld after you guys are done giving the exam and you guys want to solve UWorld, okay, so what you should do is you should sit with your first aid, okay, so take your first aid in one side and take your U worlds in another side, okay? And when you are, uh, let's say uh, you come across a question about, um, let's talk about, uh, what can we talk about? Let's say you come across a question about um, basal ganglia, okay? Let, let's say you come across a question about basal ganglia. And in that question, you realize that there is something which you need to write down because you will forget about it. Okay, there's something which you need to write down because you will forget about it. So what you can do is instantaneously in that same page or first date, either uh, if you are the type of student who does not mind writing in their books, because I know a lot of students 
uh, they mind writing in their books. So if you are the type of students who's type of student who does not mind writing in their book, just write it down in, in your book uh, in a it, it, like just like in a small space. Okay. Or if you have an issue writing in your books, what you can do is we have students, what they do is they do post-it notes. Okay. So they have post post-it notes. Um, they, what they do is they write down the question and they write down the answer in a very brief manner, and then they write it in on their page. So what happens is the next time when you go through first aid, you instantaneously remember the notes. Okay. Another one is if you feel like the uh, explanation is too big for you to write it down. If you feel like the explanation for you is too big to write it down, just write down the question ID number write down the question ID number beside the topic. Let's say you come across a question about um, cardiovascular system. Okay, write down the question uh, beside, um, write down the question ID number. So the next time what happens is when you come across that and you sit with your URL, just write down the question ID number in the URL and then you will come up with that question and then everything will be uh, extremely easy for you. That's another way. So I gave you two options. The third option is, the third option is, um, if you can maintain a URL notepad or a URL note diary, so what you guys can do for that URL note diary is uh, keep that notepad for only the wrong answers. Okay, so keep that notepad for only your wrong answers because the thing is, uh, you are more likely to um, make the same mistake twice rather than. Um, rather than answer wrong for a question which you have answered right before, okay? So you are more likely to um, answer the same question wrong rather than answer the same question right before. So just write down your wrong answers and then briefly, let's say you come across a question where um, uh, it's something about, uh, let's say, um, it's about a dermatological problem, okay? So write down the name of the diagnosis, okay? And then write down the thing which you have uh, found out about that, okay? So these are the three ways that you can make your world notes as easy and as fast as possible. So I uh, hope that helps, okay? So uh, does that answer your question, Dr. Hassan? Give the summary only or whole explanation. Okay, so uh, if you are confused about reading the summary or the whole explanation, what you can do is, um, so basically when you are solving URL, there's absolutely um, no part of the explanation which should be left behind. Keeping that in mind, um, when you are reading URL for the first time, okay, when you are reading URL for the first time, you should spend just as much time on your right answers as much as, as, as the exact amount of time which you should spend on your wrong answers. Okay, so that, that, that's, for the, that's for the first timers. And for the second timers, okay, for the, if for, let's say it's your second time. And in that second time, you, you are, your goal is to finish the URL in a shorter period of time. In that second time, what you can do is since you have, uh, since, since you have done URL once before, you can skip out on focusing a lot on the questions you have answered, right? And focusing a lot more on the questions that you have got wrong, okay, that, that you have gotten wrong. So uh, for those ones, uh, let's say it's your second time doing URL or your third time doing URL, you can uh, just focus on your wrong answers, only on your wrong answers, but th that is only for the second timers, not for the first timers. For the first timers, it is extremely important that you guys do every question with every details, okay? In every de detail. If you come across an explanation or if you come across a text which you think you cannot remember, please, please, please write them down. Write them down in your book, write them down in, in a diary, write them down in a post-it note, okay? Or if you feel like uh, maintaining a book is uh, too much of a hassle, copy and paste the information in, uh, let's say, Microsoft Words or anywhere else and copy and paste it. And then later what you can do is you can associate your learning to that, okay? Next question. Um, Okay, we have another question from Dr. Iman. So some people who are not with us in the course, they ask if you sell your videos. Okay, okay, so we have a marketing question. Okay, so, um, okay, so, so what is your question once again? So we, uh, okay, so the, the thing is, uh, I, I, 
we have not really thought about this. I mean, uh, we have not really thought about selling our videos uh, as of yet because, okay. So the thing is to a student who has not attended or who, hit, who is not actively attending our classes, especially my classes, um, to them, it will be extremely difficult because my classes are not just my notes. M my notes is, uh, it. to be honest, we don't come up with our own notes. We have first aid as the textbook, which is the notes itself, but our classes are not for the no are not just the notes itself. It's, um, it's the uh, participations of the students during the classes which are important. Right, it's the U world. Um, it's the U world uh, notes which we give out, and the discussions that we do that is important. It's the assessment exams that we take that is important. Okay, and it's the direction and the mentorship which we try to provide that is more important than, than the notes. The notes is basically first aid, so uh, that's that. Okay, but with that being said, thank you for uh, for giving us that suggestion. We will obviously try to keep that in account. And um, if you have any uh, friends or colleagues who are interested to learn more about our lectures, please ask them to send us an email to ferdin.hyderi at gmail.com. Okay, any more questions? You are absolutely welcome. Okay, any more questions? Do we have any more questions regarding USMLE? Okay, so we have faced a lot of uh, good questions today, okay, regarding the prep. Okay, we have faced our, we have faced some good questions regarding the PEP. One was one was from Dr. Hassan about how you will notes should be made. Okay, so I should have mentioned this before, uh, and uh, due to the fact that we have been trying to cover a difficult topic for the last many days, even our previous talk topic was a bit difficult, right? Musculoskeletal system, and now we are covering neurology. We have been so focused in doing first aid that uh, our discussions about uh, the preparation has been a little bit out of context. Okay, so the, uh, so once again, uh, uh, so once again, if you have to make URL notes, okay, I, I gave you guys three options. Number one, write them down in the first aid book. Number two, write them down in a post-it notes very briefly. Okay, you do not have to write the whole explanation. Just write, write just write down the answer if you know if you need to. Okay, and the last and foremost is. Um, two ways, okay? Either copy paste it in Microsoft Words or the worst come worse, take a picture of it in your phone and keep it in your phone, okay? Take a picture of your screen in, in your phone and keep it in your phone and then uh, associate the uh, first day uh, learning with it, okay? Okay, There's, there, is a, uh, there is another uh, trick, there is another uh, advice that I would like to give you guys, okay? So uh, personally, uh, I did not do this, so I have had another student, okay, that, uh, uh, so they did really well at their exam. So what they used to do was, uh, what they used to do were, so we, I had two or three students of, uh, 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 before you guys, so they came up with an amazing idea. And um, what they did was, and I'm sharing this with um, their permission, what they did was whenever they would come across a question in UWorld, which contained a histological picture, Okay, are you guys hearing my voice? Are you guys hearing my voice? Okay, good. So what they did was, whenever they would come across a question in UWorld world, which contained a histological picture or any picture of a CT scan or any picture of an MRI, they would immediately take a picture of that in, in their phone. Am I clear? Did you understand? they would immediately take a picture of that histological image or that uh, image of the CT scan immediately in their phone and then they will keep it. And they kept on doing this from the first time, uh, to, from the first time they started doing UWorld. So what happened is after the time, after the whole uh, studying of UWorld, what happened was they had a whole um, album of uh, pictures which uh, they could just go through very fast. And we know how pictures are complicating in, in the exam and it, this made things very easy for them. So this is another thing which you guys can do too. Whenever you guys get the time from now on when you guys are solving the questions, if you come across an image which you need, uh, which you feel the need to take a picture of and save it in your phone so that um, you can later go through the pictures when you have a free time, I think that would be a very, very effective way of using your phone at, at least uh, for the duration of your preparation for, uh, USC, for USMLE step one. 
Okay. Okay, so uh, hope that answers a lot of the questions and the confusions and the prep. Okay, so can we do a small 10 minute re revision of the previous class and then we can move on today? Okay, give me one second, please. Okay, we're going to start with the revision. Okay, Okay, you are absolutely welcome, Dr. Naoud and Dr. Mahesh. Okay, okay, Dr. Naoud, you have another question. I really needed that advice because that's the only aspect that we haven't stressed or focused on. Okay, so I'm 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 glad I could help you guys out. Okay, so uh, anything else you need? Any other tricks or tricks which you guys want? Please let me know, and I'll try my best to provide it for you. Okay. Okay, so let's start with uh, today's discussion. We had, um, as of right now, it's 9.35 Friday. And um, since it's Friday, uh, we, can, we can take things a little bit uh, calmly. Okay, having said that, it does not mean that we won't be finishing what we have, what we are finishing. We will be finishing that. But at the same time, we can learn things a bit slow. Okay, because we have a couple of time because tomorrow is a weekend. Okay. So we have started with uh, we have started with neurology pathology. Okay, so can, can I get some answers on what are the consequences of a frontal lobe lesion? What are the consequences of a frontal lobe lesion? Disinhibition, lack of judgment. Okay. Okay, when you have a frontal eye field lesion, do you look at the side of your paralysis or away from the side of your paralysis? Oh, wait, very good. If you have a par paramedian pontine reticular formation lesion, do you look to the side of the lesion or away from the lesion? Okay, okay. Can you guys name a disease in which there is damage to the medial longitudinal fasciculus? Very good. Okay, what is the name of the syndrome that is uh, occurring in um, a dominant parietal cortex damage? Dominant parietal cortex damage, Gerstmann syndrome. Okay, Gerstmann syndrome. And uh, Gerstmann syndrome, it contains of uh, four, uh, it contains of four, four types of Four, four conditions. Okay, so what are, what are the four conditions of Gerstmann syndrome? Number one is agraphia. Number two is acalculia. Very good. Number four is? Number four is finger agnosia. And very good. And the next one is left, right disorientation. Very good. Okay. Okay, now you have a patient who has come to you with a non-dominant parietal cortex damage. What is the, what, what is the name of the lesion? Hemispatial neglect syndrome. Very good. If you have a patient who has come to you with a history of alcoholic disorder, now the patient is confused, ataxic, has nystagmus, has an ophthalmoplegia, has personality changes. Okay. This patient is, has a warning corsicky. Okay. And how do you treat a patient with warning corsicoff syndrome? Okay. Uh, what, uh, now you have a patient who has come to you with hyper, hyperphagia, hyperorality, hypersexuality, okay, and disinhibition. What is the name of the condition? Kluver Busey, okay, okay, okay. So Kluver, Kluver Busey, okay, very good. Uh, what is the name of the condition in which the in which a patient has a difficulty in looking upwards? The patient has uh, lid retraction. The patient has convergence nystagmus. Okay, well, can you guys name one benign? brain tumor that is associated with causing perinode syndrome? Penealoma. Very good. Penealoma. Okay. Penealoma. Okay. And why is penealoma causing a dorsal midbrain lesion? Okay. I'm not expecting an answer from you guys as of yet because we have not discussed this in details. And we will when we uh, look at the tumor portions of the pathology. Okay. Next one. 
Next one is if you have a patient who has come to you with, uh, who has come to you with um, truncal ataxia and nystagmus. Okay, uh, which portion of the cerebellum is um, okay? Very good. Next one is if you have a patient who has come to you with a lesion below or at the level of the red nucleus, what is the name of the uh, what is the name of the patient's posturing posture? What right. very good D cerebrate posture D cerebrate posture. Then again, okay, very good. And we have our rhyme, which we have, uh, which we prepared for our friends and for our little kids, except we skipped out on the last two lines of the rhyme. Okay, and that rhyme is for our clinical reflex. And the rhyme goes something like C5, C6, pick up the sticks, very good. Meaning biceps and tri uh, biceps reflex. Then we have C6, C7, C8, lay them straight, very good. That, that is our triceps reflex. And then we have L2, L4. Kick the door. Kick the door for the patellar reflex. Then we have S1, S2. Buckle my shoes for Achilles reflex. That is very good. Then we have L1, L2. Okay, that is for our cremasteric reflex. Okay, another one we have S3, S4, Vinscolor. Okay, one second, guys, please. Okay, next one is, um, okay, so we will only take a couple of more minutes and then we'll be done, no problem. Okay, and then, okay. so the next one is, uh, okay. Okay, so if you have a patient who has uh, come to you with the fact that, um, with the fact that he has a uh, difficulty in uh, detecting vibration, pressure, fine touch from the lower extremities, okay, which of the nucleus in the midbrain do you think is damaged? I mean, which of the nucleus in the brain stem do you think is damaged? Okay. And the answer is gracilis. And what is the mnemonic that we use for nucleus, nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus? Legs on grass. That is very good. Okay, legs on grass. And um, that's okay. So having said that, okay, I will not go into many more further discussion because we have discussed quite a little bit on detail. Okay, quite a bit on detail. Okay, having said that, we will begin our um, lecture for today and uh, we would be trying to make a big dent on our uh, neurology pathology. Having said that, can you guys see my screen? Okay, <clears throat> okay, good. Okay, so uh, the first thing that we will be discussing today is uh, ischemic brain disease. Okay, or as we all call, as we all like to know it, as stroke. Okay, so what is stroke? Stroke is basically your uh, cessation or uh, decreased blood supply to uh, the structures of the brain. Okay, and the problem with stroke is okay. So let's say a patient who has had who is uh, having a stroke. Okay, so if you want to save the brain, try to realize that that the brain it relies on um, uh, on uh, on blood and brain and, and the brain it relies on oxygen okay so hypoxic injury and ischemic injury and the thing is ischemic injury isch, ischemia can result in an irreversible injury after five minutes of hypoxia okay so if you have decreased blood supply to the brain obviously the um, the the substrates of uh, oxygen they're also um, they they are also uh, supplied late okay so what happens is the brain has irreversible neuronal injury after five minutes of hypoxia. For, so for at least five minutes, the brain stays viable, okay? And if it continues for more than five minutes, the brain uh, goes through an irreversible injury, okay? And that irreversible injury is known as stroke. And it gets uh, extremely difficult to revive that part of the brain. And what happens is the patient has to survive with a long 
with a long-term or lifelong neurological damage. For example, if you have a patient who has had a stroke of, uh, let's say, the Broca's area, okay, of the Broca's area, then we have a condition known as aphasia or Broca's aphasia, in which the patient has difficulty talking. Okay, and the patient keeps on mumbling words, which which uh, he the he or she has a difficult time um, mentioning words which they want to talk about. So that's that. Okay. So that's basically a little bit about what stroke is. And so try to understand that five minutes is, is important. Okay, so this is a question once again, after five minutes. So if you want to save the brain, try to save the brain in five minutes. How can we save the brain if we realize the patient is having a stroke? We can either uh, administer um, thrombolytic, okay? Or uh, we can either administer a thrombolytic or we can um, try to uh, supply the patient with excess oxygen or, or any step that we want to take in order to save the patient, it has to be done in the first five minutes. Okay, so we can administer heparin and all of this and thrombolytics, everything should be done in the first five minutes. Okay, next one. Next one is another important question is, next one is another important question that let's say the patient has a stroke, which of the areas of the brain are most vulnerable for, for hypoxic injury? And the uh, mnemonic, which a first aid came up with, was vulnerable hippos need pure water. Vulnerable hippos need pure water. And, and the reason when, is that whenever first aid comes up with their mnemonic, we have to realize that it, this is extremely important because they want you to remember this. Vulnerable are hippocampus, neocortex, cerebellum, Purkinje fiber, and the watershed area. Okay, so I would need you guys to remember this right away. And... Um, I would need you guys to remember this right away. And uh, I will be asking you guys about this after a while. So try to understand or try to realize that vulnerable hippos need pure water. So we, for that, we have hippocampus, neocortex, cerebrum, um, Purkinje cells, and, okay, Purkinje cells. Okay, so, that, 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 so that's what it is. And the watershed areas. Okay, and the reason why these are most vulnerable to uh, ischemic injury is because these these are the parts of the these are the parts of the brain which are extremely active. Okay, these are the parts of the brain except the watershed area which are ex extremely extremely active, and even a small amount of uh, cessation of blood supply or oxygen can result in uh, damage to the can result in damage to the brain. Okay, so Dr. Hassan, you already got that question. Okay, so that is very good. Okay, next one. Next one is stroke imaging. Okay, so how do we image a stroke? The, the, uh, we, we, do, we do an imaging such as a fact that we can do a non-contrast uh, CT scan uh, to, ex to exclude hemorrhage, okay? So even before we can give a tissue plasminogen activator, okay, and we all know how a tissue plasminogen activator works, we have talked about this, uh, we can do a non-contrast CT to exclude hemorrhage, okay? Because if the brain is actively hemorrhaging, and on top of that, you give a tissue plasminogen activator, the hemorrhage will not stop and the patient will bleed out, okay? So that's that, okay? And then uh, the CT, the, uh, CT scan, it detects is ischemic changes in six to 24 hours. Then again, if you want to, if you want to detect the, the changes within the first three minutes to half an hour, what you have to do is you have to do a diffusion weighted MRI, okay? So surprisingly, this is also another question. Okay, so so till now in this small paragraph, we have discussed three questions. Okay, first question was, how long does it take for a brain to undergo hypoxia? The answer is five minutes. Next question was, what are the vulnerable areas of the brain? And that's hippocampus, neocortex, cerebellum, and watershed areas. Okay, and the next one was, uh, if you want to uh, image a brain or an image an ischemic injury of the brain, what do you have to do in the first three minutes to half an hour? The answer is you have to perform a diffusion weighted MRI. Diffusion weighted MRI. Okay. Okay. That's that. Okay. So hope you hope you guys have wrote uh, the stars in your book as we have written it. Okay. So moving forward, next thing is extremely important. Okay. These are the histological changes that we expect to see in a patient who has undergone stroke. And do you guys remember that we talked about a similar situation with this when we were solving cardiovascular system, we talked about uh, myocardial infarction and um, the changes in the uh, myocardium with time. Do you guys remember we talked about this? Yes. Yeah, it's approximately the same thing, that is correct. So what is, so what is happening is, so once again, 
you have the changes which are which are occurring in the brain in 12 to 24 hours and then you have the changes occurring from 24 to 72 that will three to five days one to two weeks and more than two weeks and how do we remember this okay we remember this by the way that dr uh hussein Sattar has taught us okay that is 12 to 24 hours is one day okay one day one week one month okay and i'm going to explain one day one week and one month to you guys so so what happens in the first one day or 12 to 24 hours so one 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 okay what happens within the first 12 to 24 hours from the first 12 to 24 hours you have an eosinophilic cytoplasm and a pycnotic nuclei you have a eosinophilic cytoplasm okay so if you want to do a staining of the cytoplasm of the cell okay you will realize that the cell, the cell has a pinkish appearance and the pycnotic nuclei, meaning that the nucleus have gotten smaller, okay? So a small nuclei and a pinkish cytoplasm. That is the first thing that you see in the first one day, okay? And then in one week, okay? And then one week, you, the one week gets divided into the first one to three days and then three to seven days, okay? Three to seven days, okay? Okay, keep in mind that they mentioned one to two weeks. <clears throat> keep in mind that I am aware that they mentioned one to two weeks, okay? But just for the purpose of uh, remembering all these details, I, I, we have chosen one, 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 okay? As according to uh, Patoma. So once again, in the first one hour, or first, for the first one day, we have pink cytoplasm and a small nucleus. Then for the second one, we have, um, then for the, the second one, what we have is, excuse me, what the hell is going on over here? Okay. One second, please. Okay. Okay, I have no. Can you just give me one second, please?
Okay, so, so can you guys hear my voice? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, good. Uh, I apologize for that small delay. Uh, looks like uh, Zoom has updated its um, has updated its application by itself. Okay, that is highly unlikely. Okay, so I apologize for that inconvenience. Okay, I'm really sorry. Let's go back to our uh, discussion because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, so can you guys see my screen? Okay. Okay. So what we were talking about was the fact that histological changes are in stroke. So once again, let's do a recap. So we have one day, one week, one month. One day, what happens is, so after, after one day, what, what happens is, at first, the brain goes through uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm, meaning that there's pinkish appearance of the cytoplasm and pycnotic nuclei, meaning that the nucleus of the cells becomes small. Okay, so if you find, uh, if you find uh, uh, a cell like this, okay, and, and what are the types of uh, questions that you'll be facing according to this is in post-mortem examinations, okay? So let's say if it's a post-mortem, let's say the patient has passed away and you find a cell uh, which looks like this and they ask you, the question will come as they will ask you, uh, what is the duration in, uh, uh, in which the patient has had the stroke and, the an and your answer should be within 12 to 24 hours, okay? Next one. Next one is one week, and one week was divided in one to three days and three to five days. And once again, in one to three days, we know exactly from our previous cardiovascular knowledge that what happens in one to three days, we have neutrophils, okay? And then after three to five days, what happens is we have infiltrations with macrophage. Okay, next one. Next one is after um, one to, in, after one week, okay, after one week, what you guys have to realize in, is between one month, there is fibrosis and formation of a scar, okay? But this fibration and formation of the scar, this begins from after one week, okay? So from one, so from after one week to more than one month, okay? So for after more than one month, you have a scar, but before the formation of the scar, you have reactive gliosis. And we know that the cells that are astrocytes, they are responsible for Forming uh, for causing gliosis, and we have or we also have vascular pro proliferation. We have vascular proliferation, and what are the uh, growth factors that are responsible for vascular proliferation? We talked about this. Does anyone have any idea? Does anyone have any idea? Okay, we have vascular endothelial growth factor, and we also talked about another that was FGF. Very good. Okay, we also talked about FGF, that is fibroblast growth factor. So both of these growth factors are responsible for the vascular proliferations over here. So please write them down. Okay, VEGF and FGF, please write them down in your book. Okay, so once again, very easy to understand. Okay, very easy to understand is it's what, what's happening is for the first, uh, for the first one day, we have pink nucleus, we have a pink cytoplasm and a um, small nucleus. Okay, so just give me one minute because I want to uh, draw it out for you guys. So one day, one week, one month, and then one one week you have this, okay? And the cytoplasm is pink, okay? And you have a pycnotic nuclei, okay? Then the nucleus has gone big. Next, you have between one day to one week, okay? Okay, within one day to one week, you have one to three days, and then three to, and then three, and then from uh, three days onwards to one week, you have neutrophils. And then more than three weeks, you have macrophage. And what happens between one to two weeks? Between one to two weeks? One to two weeks, okay? What you have is reactive gliosis. And from two weeks to one month, you have the form formation of the glasses. And after more than one month, you have a glial scar, okay? So if you can... Um, if you can understand this, okay, or this table can be written as simply as this one over here. Okay, so you do not have to spend a lot of time trying to remember the days, trying to remember the cells, okay? If you can uh, write down this one, the one, 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 and then be between this, um, this should help you guys to do this, uh, to learn this table in the shortest amount of time, okay? And this is a high yield table, so please keep that in mind. Okay, is everyone clear? Is everyone clear about, um, the uh, ischemic time events and how to learn the events in a small period of time, okay? This will take you one minute. This will take you absolutely one minute, okay? So once again, what are the vulnerable areas of the brain? 
which have undergone hypoxia. Hippocampus, neocortex. Please, can I get some fast answers? We have to move forward. Purkinje cells and the watershed areas. There you go, the watershed areas. Okay, next one is what is ischemic stroke? Ischemia is basically, ischemic stroke is basically acute blockage of the vessels. Acute blockage. I uh, try to understand they have said, they have mentioned acute blockage, meaning that uh, the block of the vessel has occurred in a short period of time. Okay, this results in disruption of blood flow and subsequent ischemia, and there's infarction. Okay, we all know this pathology. This is very common to us. And try to remember that, that the necrosis which occurs in the brain is liquefactive necrosis. Liquefactive necrosis, and this is a high yield question. This is another high yield question for your NBME. Okay, not euro. Okay, you will receive at least four to five questions in different NBMEs about what type of necrosis occurs in the brain and the type of necrosis that occurs in the brain is liquefactive necrosis. Can you guys tell me about the type of necrosis that occurs in the myocardium or in the heart? What is the type of necrosis that occurs in the myocardium and the heart? Okay, very good. The answer is coagulative, coagulative necrosis. Okay, coagulative necrosis. Okay, next one. Next one is uh, the three types of stroke. Okay, so first of all, we have a thrombotic, embolic, and hypoxic. Okay, so thrombotic, thrombotic meaning that uh, there is a thrombus. Okay, the thrombus has gone and occluded the, the site of blood supply. This has resulted in an infarction. The most common uh, artery that it affects is the middle cerebral arteries. Okay, commonly it affects the middle, the middle cerebral arteries. And out of the middle cerebral arteries, one of the most common artery is uh, try to realize that uh, one of the branches of the middle cerebral artery is one of the longest arteries of the brain. And which artery am I talking about? I am talking about lenticulo <clears throat> lenticulostriate arteries. The lenticulostriate arteries is one of the most common arteries to get uh, occluded either by thrombus and, uh, or either by thrombus or by embolus. Okay. So uh, lenticulostriate artery. And which of the structures of the brain are most uh, common to get damaged if there's an occlusion of lenticulostriate artery? And your answer is internal capsule and basal ganglia. Okay. Please write them down. Internal capsule and basal ganglia. If you have damage to the internal capsule, what type of stroke would you get? And uh, even before asking you, I know most of you guys know, so I'm just going to answer for you guys. That is a pure motor stroke. If you have an occlusion of the thalamus, what type of stroke will you get? You will get a pure sensory stroke. Okay, once again, internal capsule stroke, pure motor, thalamic stroke, pure sensory. Okay, next one. Next one is an embolus. <clears throat> so if you have an embolus in any part of the body, that embolus can travel all the way from the periphery up from to your heart, and then it can enter your systemic circulations. And after that, it can go and occlude any part of the artery, and this can cause an infarction. Okay, one of the most common causes of embolus to occur is, are, occur is uh, atrial fibrillation. Okay, we know atrial fibrillation is one of, is a very common cause for uh, embolus to arise. Then we have carotid artery stenosis. Okay, carotid artery stenosis. If there's, an, so there's, a, if there's a stenosis of the carotid artery by an atherosclerotic plaque, okay, a piece of that can uh, get loose and move around in your system of blood supply and occlude your brain. Next one is a very common one, that is DVT. Okay, DVT is deep vein thrombosis. And along with that, if the patient also has a patent forum and ovale, meaning that if there's a space or gap in between the interatrial septum, uh, this can result in a type of an embolus, which is known as, what is the name of these type of embolus, which can go from the left side to the right side? Very good. The name of this embolus is a paradoxical emboli. The name of these type of embolus are, is known as a paradoxical embolus. Okay. The last cause is hypoxia. Hypoxia is basically if the patient has decreased, uh, decreased uh, oxygenation of the blood, this will result in a deoxygenated blood and long-term exposure to deoxygenated blood can cause ischemic injuries. Okay. What is the treatment of the patient? So the, the thing is, if you treat the patient with tissue plasminogen activators, Okay, if you treat the patient with tissue plasminogen activators. And uh, once again, I just want to make sure if you guys remember, how does the tissue plasminogen activator work? Fast answers, please. How does a tissue? Okay, so it activates plasmin. And then what happens when you activate plasmin?
Okay. So what happens when you activate plasmin is plasmin is responsible for breaking down the fibrin clot. Okay, so plasmin is responsible. So let's say that there is a clot or a thrombus or a thrombus which has gone and occluded this part of the brain. If you give a tissue plasminogen activated, this will occlude the thrombus and the blood supply will get restored. But try to uh, be aware or try to be aware that there is no active bleeding in the CT scan. Okay, so as a physician right now, okay, so this is just a little bit out of context. As a physician right now, if, if, the, if let's say this is a patient who has come to you with active bleeding, how will you know what are the changes in the CT scan that you will realize that this patient is actively bleeding or is actively hemorrhaging into the uh, parenchyma of the brain and you have to stop TPA? What is the color of the lesion? White, very good. Okay, so white, so very, very good. And so instead of having this black thing over here, okay, okay, instead of having this, uh, black mass all the way, this thing will be completely white. Okay, this thing will be completely white. So that's, that's, so if it's white, that means that the patient has, um, this means that the patient has um, active bleeding in the brain and you have to stop with TPA. Okay, another question is why is the uh, brain parenchyma white in case of uh, active bleeding and black in case of uh, long-term previous bleeding? Does anyone have any idea? Calcium, very good. Calcium, very good. Okay, so uh, I have discussed about this in the past. Okay, but Dr. Iman and Dr. Hussein, you guys were not there in the past. So you guys are sharing this from your knowledge and we thank you for this. Okay, so what happens is if the patient has an active bleeding, okay, blood contains a whole lot of calcium. And when you do a CT scan, that calcium is uh, uptaken and it appears as it, it appears as white. And, and as uh, the calcium keeps on dissipating, Okay, this you, this uh, this eventually turns into black. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so try to remember that these are just basic knowledges. Okay, next one. The next one is um, after. So we can so try to realize that we have to give it at least between um, okay between three to four and a half hours. Or if there's a large artery occlusion, what can we what can we do? We what we can do is we can do a thrombectomy. Okay, we can open up the skull and do a thrombectomy. Okay. Another one is if you have a patient who has a high risk of stroke, okay, the patient can be given prophylactic aspirin and clopidogrel, okay, and we talked about how aspirin works. Aspirin works by uh, anyone, just a small recap of hematology, mechanism of action of aspirin. Very good. Mechanism of action of clopidogrel. Mechanism of action of clopidogrel. Very good. Okay, that's that. Okay, next one. Next one is next one is we also have to control the blood pressure, blood sugar, lipids, smoking. Okay, we all know this. Okay, this is these are not new to us. So that's that. Okay, so what are the type of questions that you will be receiving from uh, this uh, topic over here? We have already discussed this. First of all, the type of question that you you will receive is, uh, well, what are the type of necrosis that is happening in a in a brain? Next one is uh, what, what is the name of the embolus? Paradoxical emboli that occurs from the left side to the right side. Okay, if you have to treat the patient with TPA, when do you have to administer it? You have to administer between the first three to four and a half hours. Next one is uh, before you administer, if you see that the CT scan is white, try to realize the patient is actively bleeding and avoid using uh, TPAs. Okay, next one. Next one is TIAs or transient isch isch ischemic attack, transient ischemic attack, okay? And what happens is over here, you have brief reversible ep episodes of focal neurologic dysfunction without acute infarction, okay? So what happens with transient isch ischemic stroke or ischemic attack is you have a transient or small period of decreased blood supply to the brain okay, because the brain is highly vulnerable to absence of uh, blood, right? So if you have decreased blood supply to the brain for, uh, for any period of time, for even a small amount of time, what the brain can do is the brain can just shut down. And what happens is if there's immediate resto restoration of blood supply, okay, if there's immediate restoration of blood supply, the brain wakes up again and the patient is conscious again. So there's a brief pe period of unconsciousness. This brief period of unconsciousness is known as transient ischemic attack, okay? Okay, so if you are a patient who, who is, I mean, if you are a doctor who is working in um, 
in an emergency department, okay? So you will get a lot of patients who has come to you in the last third of the night, most commonly, and uh, or in the evenings. And the patient will usually be accompanied, let's say, by a family member. And they will come and tell you that this patient has, um, what he was working as usual, or he was doing something, let's say, watching TV or something. And then out of nowhere, the patient lost consciousness, fell, and he fell on the floor. And in exactly uh, one minute or two, the patient revived consciousness and the patient uh, is okay now. Okay, so whenever you hear something like this, there are some things which you have to exclude right away. The first things that you have to exclude right away are metabolic changes. Okay, so you have to realize that the patient has had hypertension, low blood sugar. Okay, if, the, if there's something wrong with the patient's electrolyte levels, if the patient has a past history of uh, seizures, okay, if the patient is on any type of medication, or the next thing which you have to exclude is transient ischemic attack. Okay, so you have to exclude transient ischemic attack. So what, so what what you have to do is you have to admit the patient and then you have to keep the patient under observation to see if there is uh, if there is an attack again. Because what would happen with a patient with transient ischemic attack is that the if you perform an MRI, okay, we said that MRIs can detect uh, the changes in the first three minutes to half an hour. In transient ischemic attack, these MRIs will not detect any changes. So the patient has to be under observation to see if uh, any of these um, any of these uh, conditions happen again. Okay, is everyone clear about transient ischemic attack, or what we or what I just said? Clear. Okay. So uh, so this is for for the purpose of uh, your. Uh, this is, the, this is for the purpose of your uh, performance as a doctor in the hospital. Do you guys uh, understand now, did you guys realize how you should manage a patient who has had a short period of unconsciousness? What do you have, what you have to exclude? Okay, what, what is your question? Uh, you, I have a question between the treatment and irreversible injury for ischemic stroke. Okay, so what is your question once again? What is your question, please, Dr. Kabasi? Okay, so please write down the question and uh, I will answer the question in due time. Having said that, did you guys uh, did you guys understand on how to manage a patient appropriately with un uh, who has come to you with a brief period of unconsciousness? Okay, good. Next one. Next one is uh, neonatal intraventricular hemorrhage. What is neonatal in intraventricular hemorrhage? So what happens is uh, in uh, little babies, okay, in neonates who are a, who are let's say premature or they have a low birth weight, so they have a highly vascular highly vascularized layer within the subventricular zone. Okay, so uh, so beneath the ventricles, when to. Uh, beneath the ventricles, meaning the subventricular zone, we have a layer of a highly vascularized, vascularized layer, which originates in the germinal matrix, okay? So there is a part of the brain which originates from the germinal matrix, and we will be talking in details about the germinal matrix in embryology, okay? But for now, just try to realize that, that a layer of the brain, which is highly vascularized, and originating from the germinal matrix in the subventricular zone, this area is highly, highly vulnerable to uh, undergo hemorrhage, especially in neonates, okay? And uh, the reason why, for which this happens is because the neonates have, especially premature neonates, what they have is they have reduced glial fiber support, meaning that they have reduced support from surrounding connective tissues, and they also have impaired autoregulation of blood pressure. So we, we know that autoregulation of blood pressure occurs through the carotid and uh, carotid sinus and aortic arch bare receptors and chemoreceptors. And um, in infants, uh, the, these autoregulations are not developed yet and more so in premature infants. So what happens is even with a little amount of increase in blood pressure, uh, this results in spontaneous hemorrhage from the um, germinal matrix. Okay, so the question is, this is a very high yield question for US Assembly step one. Okay, this is a very high yield question for US Assembly step one. They will tell you that you have a patient who is a premature neonate, okay, who has come to you with these symptoms. Okay, these are the exact same complaints with the patient will, will have. So this is a question. Okay, this will be present in your question. And the patient will complain of altered level of con consciousness, meaning the mother will come and tell you that my baby uh, was uh, normal 
playing and uh, what happened was now the uh, baby is uh, the uh, baby has fallen into sleep and has had difficulty uh, arising from that uh, period of sleeping along with that I have also realized that my that my baby has uh, has a mass in the uh, head which has been increasing because the mother does not understand the term of a bulging fontanelle so they will complain of a mass okay so so if you look at a baby who has decreased uh, level of awareness has a bulging fontanelle Okay, they, and if the patient does, if the patient does not have a fever, and you exclude meningitis, okay, along with that the patient also has hypotension. This is extremely extremely concerning for a neonatal intraventricular hemorrhage. Okay, so if this is extremely concerning for a neonatal intraventricular hemorrhage, and what you have to do is you have to realize that, that if it's a premature infant, the bleeding is from the germinal matrix. The bleeding is from the germinal matrix. Okay, and. Uh, if you perform a scan, you will see that there is bleeding into the ventricles. You will see that there's bleeding into the ventricles, okay? So intraventricular hemorrhage, meaning that there's bleeding into the ventricles. And um, what will happen is, uh, what would happen is there will be extension into the periventricular white matter, okay? So, so, this, so this bleeding has extended out and this bleeding is present in the periventricular white matter. Okay, next one. So are you guys clear about um, the neonatal interventricular hemorrhage? Okay, good. Okay, so how is it possible to treat TPA within four hours, but we know that after five minutes, we will have irreversible injury. That is very, that is a, ve that is a very good question. Okay, so the optimum time, okay, the most optimum time for the brain to survive is five minutes, okay? The most optimum time for the brain to survive is five minutes. So we have a question from Dr. Karbasi, who has asked us that what, uh, how can we treat the patient between four to five hours, even though the brain undergoes irreversible injury in five minutes, okay? So that's a very good question. So what we have to understand is uh, the whole brain does not undergo uh, irreversible injury in five minutes, okay? So there are parts of the brains which are more, which are more vulnerable. So let's say hippocampus, right? Then, uh, then we also have we all we also have neocortex, cerebellum, Purkinje cells, watershed areas, and those those parts of the brain that are extremely vulnerable. So, in order for us to be extremely optimum, extremely optimum, we can uh, administer the drugs in the first five minutes, and this will result in complete resolution of the stroke, meaning that the patient will not have any sign symptoms of uh, the, the stroke, but. We also have a period of four to five hours during which if we do not act between the first four to five hours, the patient will not even survive, okay? So uh, what would happen is that the necrosis and ischemia will set in and this, and since the brain is highly vascularized, this will keep on spreading throughout the whole brain and it will, re it will result in brain death, okay? So in order for us to prevent damage to any other structure or to save the brain, Okay, we have to treat the patient at least within the first four to five hours because uh, it's highly unlikely that doctors can uh, prescribe the drugs in the first five minutes because it takes some time for the patient to arrive to the hospital from the onset of the signs symptoms, right? So uh, that's that. And uh, even though the patient will have to survive with neurological con conditions, right, due to the stroke, but at least the patient will survive. So that is the answer, okay? Uh, is it clear, Dr. Karbasi? Okay, hopefully that is clear. Okay, hopefully that is clear. Okay, having said that, we have we can move forward. Okay, what is your question, please, Dr. Hassan? What is your question? Okay, so write down your question and I will answer it after our discussion. Okay, so please write down the question. Okay, next one. Next one is intracranial hemorrhage. Okay, so we will be talking about intracranial hemorrhage and in intracranial cranial hemorrhage, we have four types of hemorrhage that we have to master. So what? So out of those four types of hemorrhage, I'm pretty sure you guys know all the names, but I'm just going to uh, name them uh, name them very fast and then we will discuss each and every hemorrhage in details along with the scans okay so what is the first hemorrhage the first hemorrhage is epidural hematoma next one is a subdural hematoma the third one is subarachnoid hematoma or, or subarachnoid hemorrhage and the fourth one is intraparenchymal hemorrhage 
Okay, so first one is an epidural hematoma. So what is an epidural hematoma? Okay, epidural hematoma is basically, let's say you have a patient over here. Okay, let's say this is the skull of the patient. An epidural, meaning that it, the, the, the hemorrhage has occurred above the, the hemorrhage has occurred above the dura matter. Okay, the epidural is the hemorrhage that has occurred above the dura matter and beneath the skull. Okay, and the layer of blood supply, the layer of blood supply that we know that is present in that in that area is middle meningeal artery. Okay, middle meningeal artery. Okay. Okay. And how do you, uh, okay, so I know a lot of students, they have a lot of difficulty trying to remember middle meningeal artery and bridging veins. Okay, do math for uh, subdural. Okay, so what, what you have to understand is, let's say, uh, there's a, there's a small mnemonic which you can use is MMA is a mixed martial arts or mixed martial arts. I'm pretty sure you guys know what MMA is. It, uh, if you guys have heard about UFC, I know, I know a lot of the male physicians over here are extremely excited right now. Okay, so MMA is basically um, your, your, your UFC fightings. Okay, so what happens in an MMA fight is basically if you get hit in the head, let's say you get hit in the skull, right? So let's say if you get hit in the skull over here, Let's say you let's say someone kicks another fighter in the skull. Immediately, the damage will occur beneath the skull. Okay, so beneath the skull is the area of the epidural area. And try to realize that this occurred during an MMA fight. MMA fight can also help you remember that this area contains middle meningeal artery. Okay, so there should not be any more confusion. If you try to remember which artery is damaged in epidural hematoma during your exam, if you are scared, try to think about. MMA. MMA is mixed martial arts fighting. And MMA fighting, you you hit a patient. Let's say you you hit a fighter in the skull, and there is bleeding just beneath the skull. Okay. So and the artery that is damaged is middle meningeal artery. Okay. So just beneath the skull, you also have the dura mater, and then you also have the middle meningeal artery. And uh, the most uh, common area of the brain that is damaged, or that where the damage is occurring is known as a terian. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys know what a terian is. Terian is the point where the bones meet. Okay, terian of skull. Okay, so this is the terian. Okay. So this is known as the terian, the, the meeting of the bones. Okay, so this one. Do you see how the parietal sphenoid frontal and temporal bone, they meet all together in this one small uh, position. If you hit someone in this area, okay, let's say, uh, let's say an MMA fighter receives a kick in this area, then the patient is more likely to get epidural hematoma. Uh, try to take a picture of this or try to write this down in your uh, book. Uh, I think it's already there in your book. Okay, just try to write, try to take a picture of this in your phone so that you understand what a tear is, okay, or just try to memorize it. Okay, so this this is what a terian is. Okay, I'm not sure if you guys remember this from your anatomy knowledge. Okay, that that's what it is. Okay, okay. So this is a terian. Okay. So and so what happens is if someone gets uh, if someone gets an epidural hematoma, what will what will happen is they will have a loss of consciousness, but they will recover very soon. Okay, so they will have loss of consciousness, but then they will recover very soon. And um, what also would be occurring is that the lesion that you would be seeing in the brain is if you do a CT scan, if you do a CT scan, the lesion that you will be seeing is let's say that this is the area where the patient received the blow, okay? And the lesion that you'll be seeing is a lens type lesion, okay? So this is as if it's a, as if it's a lens, okay? So it's a lens type lesion. It's a lens type lesion. Let's say if, if you draw the pupils over here, okay? This could easily be an eye, right? Okay. Okay, so that's what it is. So that's what it is. So it's a lens type lesion. So the lesion, the, the lesion type is a lenticular type. And uh, what happens is, uh, what happens is these parts of the lesion, let's say these ends, okay? These ends of the lesion, they are not, um, they're intact. Okay, these lane, these uh, parts of the of the lesion, they're intact, so the blood doesn't dissipate all throughout the brain, right? And it stays confined to that to this area. But what is the what 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 the main issue is? If you have a hematoma of the brain, okay, this can put pressure on your brain structures, 
this can put pressure on all the other structures of your brain and this can result in neurological sign symptoms and a mo uh, the most common uh, nerve a cranial nerve that can get damaged in uh, epidural hematoma is uh, your third cranial nerve okay so there could also be an ophthalmic nerve injury and if there's an ophthalmic nerve injury we can we can also get sign symptoms of uh, we can also get sign symptoms of perinod syndrome okay so it's three and three palsy or ophthalmic palsy okay and uh, so what would also be happening is um, you can also get a uh, certain um, types of herniations over here and i do i do not want to discuss the herniations uh, as of right now we will discuss the herniations in details later okay so this is basically your whole story about epidural hematoma okay so you will get a lot of questions from over here Okay, we will get a lot of questions from over here is what is the type of the leech? What is the type of the hematoma? The type of the hematoma is a lenticular hematoma, which uh, artery is damaged in epidural hematoma. The artery that is damaged in epidural hematoma is a middle meningeal artery. Then, uh, then what happens is um, what type of uh, cranial nerve palsy is more common in epidural hematoma? The cranial nerve palsy that, that is common in epidural hematoma is an ophthalmic nerve injury or CN3 palsy. Okay. Are you guys clear about epidural hematoma? Are you guys clear about epidural hematoma? Any questions? Any questions? Do we have any questions from epidural hematoma? Okay. Okay, good. Why third cranial nerve? Okay, so it's a good, good question. So third cranial nerve, okay, so why is there injury to the third cranial nerve? There's injury to the third cranial nerve because at the most common local location, that is the terian, okay? So you have the hematoma, which, uh, which is occurring at the most common location, that is the terian. The nucleus of the ophthalmic nerve lies in close proximity to the hematoma that usually occurs in terian. So patients are more likely than often uh, presenting with uh, sign symptoms of ophthalmic nerve injury. Okay, is, is that clear? Because if only if only if it's clear, then I would move forward, or else I, I'm I'm going to wait for you all. Okay, okay, good. Next one. Next one is uh, subdural hematoma. Okay, next one is a subdural hematoma. So the next one is what is subdural hematoma? Once again, if the epidural hematoma is the damage to the middle meningeal artery, okay, the subdural hematoma. We talked about the fact that uh, that in that in between the dura matter and the arachnoid matter, you have veins known as bridging veins. Okay, and subdural hematoma is basically uh, your uh, rupture of those bridging veins. Okay, so subdural hematoma is basically your rupture of those bridging veins over here. Okay, so what happens is um, what happens is there are uh, two types of uh, there there are two types of condition in which uh, the patients usually present with a subdural hematoma. This could either be an uh, elderly patient or this could either be a uh, very young patient. So in young patients, we have a condition known as shaken baby syndrome. We have, we, uh, have you guys heard ever in news about shaken baby syndrome or child abuse? I'm pretty sure you guys have heard about child abuse. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, so this is a very sickening condition which um, the parents, which the parents usually have is that they, they take out their frustrations on little babies, okay? And what they do is uh, they take out their angers. And especially if it's not the parents, it's the caretaker. So uh, even if the parents are not the ones who are involved, it's usually the nanny or anyone else who is taking care of the baby. So what they do is um, they, they uh, when they get angry, they shake the baby really, um, they shake the baby really violently. And what this occurs is that, that little babies have veins which are very, very friable and fragile. And when you shake the baby very uh, violently and frequently, what this results is this can result in a rupture of the bridging vein. This, this can result in a rupture of the bridging vein and the baby can result with a subdural hematoma. This can result with a subdural hematoma and also in uh, elderly abuse, okay? So if, if, we, if you come across a patient who is an elderly and, the pa and you suspect that the patient is undergoing abuse in their house by their, let's say, son or or like anyone else, okay, or by their daughter. So uh, what would happen is uh, even in, um, uh, let's say uh, that um, the patient receives a trauma 
okay, to the uh, to the skull. The more often than none, if the if the if the trauma has not affected the middle meningeal artery, the trauma will have affected the bridging vein. So, how do you try to realize uh, that the your patient has a subdural hematoma or an epidural hematoma? Okay. The most common way that you can realize that your patient has an epidural hematoma, I mean, I mean subdural hematoma, is that in case of subdural hematoma, the hematoma is crescenteric shaped. Okay, so first of all, you cannot diagnose the type of hematoma based on history. Okay, you have to diagnose the hematoma based on a scan. So if in the scan you see a lens, it's an epidural hematoma. And if in the scan you see a crescent, crescenteric, meaning a half moon, okay, crescenteric uh, lesion in the brain, then this is known as a subdural hematoma. This is known as a subdural hematoma, okay. And uh, and the and what what this can do is, do you remember how I told you that in a in a um, lenticular lesion of the brain that is in a happy that is in an epidural hematoma? These are the parts of the brain. These are the parts of the lesion that is um, that is. Uh, intact. So this results in pressure uh, of the brain structures. But what happens with this one is uh, with the subdural hematoma, these parts are not intact. So the blood keeps on dissipating throughout the whole brain and this puts pressure on the brain. And this results in a condition which is known as a midline shift. So the whole, um, so let's say there are structures over here. Okay. So let's say these are, there are, there are structures over here, right? Okay, let's say this was the, this, okay, this, these are, the, the, uh, these were the ventricles. Okay, and what happens is with the uh, growing of this hematoma, this pushed on the ventricles and the, the ventricles will keep on going this way. And this is known as a midline shift. Okay, so this is known as a midline shift. And um, okay, so once again, uh, once again, these are the two. Okay, so there's another thing once again, that if you see that this part is white, then it's an acute hemorrhage. If you see this part is uh, white, once again, it's an acute hemorrhage due to the presence of calcium. If it has gone black, or dark, then it's an uh, old hem. Uh, uh, this has this hemorrhage has occurred a long time back. Okay, so this is your subdural hematoma. Subdural hematoma. Are we clear? Did you guys understand subdural hematoma? Okay. Do we have any? Okay. Okay. So before I move forward, just I would just like to know if you guys have understood. Once again. What is the mnemonic that we used for understanding or remembering epidural hematoma? MMA, MMA for mixed martial arts. Okay, you kick the patient and then what happens? I mean, you will not kick the patient, obviously. Okay, you will have a patient who has come to you after being kicked. Okay, please remember to do not kick your patients. Okay, no. okay. Okay, next one. Okay, so what happens when you, uh, when someone gets kicked? Can I get some answers, please? What is the most common location? Very good, Tarian fracture. Okay, so the most common location is the Tarian fracture. Okay, very good. And then what is the shape of the hemorrhage that, uh, or the shape of the hematoma that occurs in, uh, that occurs over here? Lenticular. Okay, very good. What is the shape of the hemorrhage that occurs in a subdural uh, in that one? Crescenteric. Okay, very good. Okay, next one. Next one is uh, we have this another type of hematoma. This is that is known as sub, as a subarachnoid hematoma. Okay, and the way the patients will describe a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, it's not a hematoma. Okay, it's a hemorrhage. Okay, so the difference between hematoma is a hematoma is a confined uh, region of the brain that is uh, putting pressure due to the accumulation of blood and hemorrhage is an active bleeding into the brain okay so hemorrhage is uh, the subarachnoid hemorrhage is a very complicated and a very a painful condition for a patient and where the patient will complain that the patient has never received these this type of uh, this type of headache in their life this will be the worst headache the patient will come to you and 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 some patients will also cry okay because the pain is so horrible the patients, the patients will come to you and tell you that, that this is the worst headache of my life, okay? And the patient will have signs, symptoms of, let's say, one or two neurological deficit, okay? Why? Because the hemorrhage is putting pressure into the brain, okay? And then when, when you do a CT scan, okay? So when you do a, when you do a CT scan, 
what you see is uh, you you would see that th that these patients they can have uh, they can have a rupture okay they they can have a rupture or an active bleeding into the brain okay and the most common reason re the most common reason is usually due to an, due to a rupture of an aneurysm okay usually due to a rupture of an aneurysm and that aneurysm could be let's say a saccular aneurysm or let's say a berry aneurysm okay and uh, so what happens is when, when you have the rupture of those type of aneurysm, we all know what, the, what, an, what an aneurysm is. Once again, aneurysm is abnormal dilatation of the blood vessels. And um, the, if there is a rupture of that, of that aneurysm in the brain, this will result in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, and subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, if you do a lumbar puncture, okay, if you do a lumbar puncture of the brain, of the, of the patient, okay, this will result in a bloody, the uh, bloody CSF. Okay, the CSF will be bloody. So there will be blood in the CSF, same as spinal fluid. Okay, bloody CSF. Okay, and, and along with that, if you try to do an imaging of the brain, you will see that these were the portions where uh, these were the portions where, let's say, the patient, your normal, you know, normal patient. This is what you see that when you do a CT scan, you see these uh, ventricles over here. But in these patients, what you will see that there is occlusion of the ventricles by blood. So there will be there will be whiteness. Okay, there, there, there will be white ventricles. So that's what it is. So, uh, and uh, the most common, uh, the most common um, treatment for uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, the most common treatment for subarachnoid hemorrhage is uh, we have this calcium channel blocker. Okay, we have this calcium channel blocker known as nemodipine. Okay, we have this calcium channel blocker known as nemodipine. Okay, nemodipine. And what this does is this helps reduce the uh, vasodilatation, okay, and this causes vasospasm. Okay, this causes this causes vasospasm. And if you do not control your patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage, what this will do is that since it's bleeding into the ventricles, this will result in to hydrocephalus. So the intracranial pressure can also increase. Okay, so these are some common um, conditions or notes about subarachnoid hemorrhage. So how will you receive a question about subarachnoid hemorrhage? The patient will come and the patient will come and tell you that first of all, that this is the worst headache of my life. Okay. And, and he has that he, he or she has never received an episode or had an episode with, the, with these type of, uh, these type of headaches. And along with that, you can see one or two neurological deficits. And then immediately when you do a lumbar puncture, what do you see? You see a bloody discharge, okay, bloody CSF. And then there's another thing which you can see that that, that thing is known as, um, uh, that thing is known as xanthochromia, okay? I'm not sure if you guys have heard. Xanthochromia is also yellowish of the CSF, so yellow CSF, okay? So xanthochromia, so that, that's also another thing which you, which you can see. And if you make your diagnosis about subarachnoid hemorrhage and you refer the patient to a neurological surgeon, okay? And, and I mean to neuromedicine, Okay, if it's um, if it uh, if it, if, but the, the, this is a, this is a surgical emergency where the aneurysm has to be. The most common reason is due to a rupture of an aneurysm, so there have to be proper arterial nicking, or a stoppage of the bleeding. So the, the aneurysm has to be controlled, and then after that, the patient can be on long-term uh, nemodipine supply of medications. The patient's bleeding can be can be controlled by nemodipine because nemodipine causes vascular constriction or vasospasm. Okay, did you guys understand? Subdural hematoma also occur in babies. Yes, in shaken baby syndrome. Yes, nemodipine. Nemodipine causes vasospasm and subarachnoid hemorrhage, but normally it causes vasodilatation. Peripheral vasodilatation. Okay. Okay. So what what's happening with nemodipine is the nemodipine is a calcium channel blocker. And what is the role of calcium in um, what is the role of calcium in uh, in, in 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 your vasoconstriction? What is the role of calcium for basal constriction? Okay. Okay, good. So if you prevent uh, calcium uh, entry or if you block the calcium, what would happen? Will there be vasodilatation or uh, vaso vasoconstriction? Okay. 
So uh, if we prescribe the patient, uh, if we prescribe the patient uh, nemodipine for uh, an active bleeding, will there be more bleeding or less bleeding? How will there be less bleeding? All right. Okay, so what happens is when you give a patient nemodipine, for the first period of time, okay, in the case of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, for the first period of time, this is a bit uh, difficult to understand. So what happens is the nemodipine, usually what it, what it causes is all types of cancer channel blockers causes vasodilatation, vasodilatation. But in case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage, since there's active bleeding, there's an initial stage of spasm, okay? There's an initial stage of uh, the vessel spasm, which the which the nemodipine causes, okay, and and for the for that initial stage of uh, vascular spasm, right, to, for the prevention of vascular spasm, so so for the initial stage of uh, vascular spasm, we give nemodipine to prevent that um, blockage of blood supply to the um, to prevent that blockage of blood supply to, to a certain portion of the brain. So what happens is as soon as you start actively bleeding into the uh, ventricles, there is release of mediators, okay? There is release of uh, mediators such as endothelium, okay? And then all other vaso vasoconstrictors, okay? And this can result in uh, occlusion of blood supply and, and result in an um, ischemic stroke. And uh, the thing is we give nemodipine for that initial period of time to pre prevent that damage that is caused by the vasospasm. Are we clear? You did not get that, okay. Okay, what happens when you have active bleeding in the brain? Does the body have uh, its uh, innate mechanism? Uh, does the body have an innate mechanism for controlling bleeding? Yes or no? Does the body have an, oh yes, okay, good. So what are the substances that causes active bleeding, uh, that stops active bleeding? Okay, for example, endothelium, okay? But right now, if the, if, if the brain is losing blood and at the same time, and at the same time, there's also a base of constriction, will there be more damage to the brain or less damage to the brain? Less, more damage to the brain, that is correct. So in order for us to prevent more damage to the brain, in order for us to prevent more damage to the brain, okay, we give calcium channel blocker to prevent the damage caused by the vasospasm. Are we clear? Okay, Dr. Maheshwari, are we clear now? Okay, does anyone have any more questions about the treatment? Okay, good. Next one. Okay, next one is, okay, let's go to our text and see if we have covered almost everything, okay? Let's see what's going on over here. So we have, first of all, what do we have? We have the rupture, we have an epidural hematoma. We talked about the fact that there's a rupture of middle meningeal artery, okay? We talked about this and we talked about transient loss of consciousness, okay? This condition is known as a lucid interval. I'm sure you guys know what the lucid, lucid, interval, lucid interval is, okay? And uh, we also talked about the third cranial nerve palsy. What we did not talk about was transtentorial herniation. And I told you I will talk about this when I talk about the herniation, of, when, when I talk about the herniations of the brain. So please uh, have some, please have patience and I will uh, um, cover this in five minutes, okay? The next one is, uh, once again, what is, what is the lesion, the, the structure of the lesion that you see in the CT scan and the structure which you see is a lentiform lesion or a lens-like lesion, okay, that's that, or a bi biconvex lens-like lesion. Next one is a subdural hematoma, okay, where there's rupture of the bridging veins. Once again, how can you remember the uh, vessels? The vessels are remembered by remembering the fight of MMA and in MMA fighters, they kick uh, people in the terian, okay, and when they kick people in the terian, they have rupture of uh, the middle meningeal artery, so MMA. And when you have an MMA fighter who kicks uh, the uh, the uh, another fighter and uh, the terian, the type of hematoma that they get is epidural hematoma. Subdural hematoma is seen basically in two conditions, in very old patients or in very young patients. In very young patients, you have shaken baby syndromes, okay? And it, it's also seen in certain other, other conditions such as uh, trauma. Okay, trauma is obviously a very important condition for uh, hematoma to occur. Then we have uh, elderly patients, okay, and even on alcoholism, okay, because in alcoholism there is uh, there is malnutrition or uh, severe uh, problems for which the blood vessels are extremely fragile. So that's that. Okay. 
the lesion that we talked about was a crescenteric lesion, as you can see over here, and they can cause the midline. Okay, so that's what it is. Another one was a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And as you can see over here, that the, that the ventricles of the patients cannot be seen due to the presence of blood. Okay, and <clears throat> there's uh, the most common reason is due to a rupture of an aneurysm. When you do a CSF puncture, you see, uh, you, when you do a lumbar puncture, you see bloody discharge or yellowish discharge. Okay, that's that. And another one is uh, we talked about the fact of how nemotipine is used to reduce the vagus spasm. Okay, next one. Next one is in, intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Okay, this is the one that we did not discuss, intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So intraparenchymal hemorrhage, what is intraparenchymal hemorrhage? This is basically your, um, this is basically a most commonly caused by systemic hypertension. Okay, so if you have a patient who has long-term systemic hypertension, this can result in, in bleeding or into the parenchyma of the brain. And as you can see over here, that you have this active acute bleeding, which is white due to the presence of calcium in the blood. Okay, so this is known as, in, in, as an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Another one is uh, amyloid angiopathy, okay? Am amyloid angiopathy. Angiopathy and amyloid is basically, uh, you have conditions such as primary amyloidosis, or uh, let's say um, you also have some other condition in which there's deposition of amyloid. Amyloid is basically a type of uh, protein which, is, uh, which, which the body has a hard time breaking it down, okay? So what happens is these amyloids, they go and they deposit in the blood vessels and they make the walls of the blood vessels extremely fragile. And even in a small increase in our blood pressure, this can result in breakage of the blood vessels. And some other reasons are vasculitis and neoplasm, okay? So once again, if you have a patient with vasculitis, the patients have a fragile blood vessel and more prone to, uh, more prone to rupture and, and even in uh, neoplasmic conditions. Because in neoplasmic conditions, the tumor cells, they invade the blood vessels. That's what it is, okay? And um, okay, so this, there is this one condition that I wanna talk about, and that is uh, Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysm. So Charcot-Bouchard, microaneurysm. And this is known as a hypertensive hemorrhage. Okay. And so try to understand that if you have a patient who has a long-term uh, history of uh, difficulty in managing uh, blood pressure. Okay. If you have a patient who has a long-term history and difficulty in managing blood pressure, and that patient gets a sudden uh, onset of neurological changes. Okay. And if you have a question like this, that you have had a patient who has had a history of, um, who has had a history of, uh, of maintain of who has had a history of not being able to control their blood pressure, okay, that patient will uh, come up with, uh, so that that patient with them, I mean, that question will ask you what type of aneurysm is occurring over here, and the name of the aneurysm is known as Charcot-Bouchard aneurysm. Once again, patient with a long history of not maintaining blood pressure now presents to you with neurological sign symptoms, let's say movement disorders or more hemi Asia or, or hemiparesis, okay? And if the question asks you about an association of uh, blood pressure and stroke, try to realize that they might be directing you to a Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysm question. Charcot-Bouchard microaneurysms are basically small aneurysms that occur due to uh, high blood pressure in arteries known as lenticulostriate artery. We know that these are the, this is the branch of, mid, of middle cerebral arteries, okay? So there is damage to the basal ganglia, followed by damage to the thalamus, pons, and cerebral. So the patients can have multiple types of, uh, multiple types of uh, presentations. Okay, are we clear about the types of hematoma? Very good. So you got a question about this with, with an image. Okay, good. Okay. okay, so let's discuss the uh, images very quick. Okay. Okay, please feel free to unmute yourself and answer the question. Okay. So what is the type of hemorrhage and the hematoma for this one? Subdural hematoma. What is the type of hematoma for this one? Epidural hematoma. Okay. What is the, okay. What is the type of hematoma for this one? Intrabranchymal. Intrabranchymal, Intrabranchymal yeah. Okay. Intrabranchymal. Very good. And now... If everything in the brain has gotten white and even the ventricles cannot be seen, what, what is the type of hemorrhage? Subarachnoid. Very good. Subarachnoid, yeah. Thank you so much. Subarachnoid. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, so if you can understand the image, that is 90% of your question of 90% of your answer in, in answering the questions of hematoma. Any more questions about hematomas and hemorrhage of the brain before I move forward?
Subdual hematoma. Okay, maybe maybe repeat Charcot Bouchard microaneurysm. Charcot Bouchard. Okay, Charcot Bouchard microaneurysms are aneurysms of small microvessels of the brain, which occurs due to long-term problems with controlling blood pressure. If you have a patient with long-term controlling of blood pressure, who has a problem with long-term controlling of blood pressure, we know that this causes fragility of the walls of the blood vessels due to, due to a condition such as hyaline arteriosclerosis. Hyaline arteriosclerosis. And, and with hyaline arteriosclerosis, what happens is you have fragility of the walls of the blood vessels, which can result in rupture of the blood vessels. If there is rupture of the blood vessels, these blood vessels are usually the ones that is lenticulostriate vessels of the middle cerebral artery. And if there is rupture of the lenticulostriate vessels of the middle cerebral artery due to charcot bouchard aneurysm, due to blood pressure problems, the patients can have damage to basal ganglia, thalamus, pons. Okay, is that clear? Perfect. Okay, all right. Break already? Okay, so, okay, okay, all right. Okay, so before I go for the break, have you guys had the chance to check out my lecture on stroke? Ha do I have any Dr. Hyderi page followers over here who has had the chance to go through some of my old videos? Not yet. Okay, no problem. No problem. Okay, so, so do you guys need a break right now before we start the stroke? Okay, so, um, okay, so there's another thing. So do you guys want to, um, do you guys want to discuss stroke or do you guys want to, um, do you guys want to uh, learn it from the video? Because this will save us some time since already the video on the stroke has been made. That is completely up to you. Okay, you want to discuss good. Because the reason why I came up with was because, um, okay, good. Okay, so we will discuss it, no problem. Okay, we will discuss it. No, the reason why I wanted to skip this was because uh, I needed to uh, save some time. So I thought that um, since I already made a video about this, uh, this will help us um, move forward a bit faster because uh, that way we can stay ahead of um, our, uh, this can be that way we can stay ahead of our schedule. Okay, but if everyone is not on the same page, I, I, I cannot move forward. If any, if, if even one student wants me to discuss the stroke topic, I can, so, okay. Okay, so apparently my brother told me that there is this one poll thing that you can do over here. Okay, so I have no idea how to do that. So there's this one poll thing where they ask you to, um, where I can ask a question and see the amount of percentages. Okay, I don't even know how to do this. Okay, so I'm a very technologically challenged. Okay, as you guys can know from my lack of skills to manage internets and um, this and that, okay. It's very technologically challenged over here. So I'm looking for a poll, okay. So if I could have caught in a poll question, I don't even know how. So do you guys know by any chance how to come up with a poll question? Anyone? No. Okay, good. So discuss, okay. So we will discuss it, no problem, okay. So we will discuss it and what we will do is we will try to discuss it very briefly, okay. But at the same time, we will not be jumping through it, okay. So uh, discussion, is, uh, discussion, is a, discussion is a very safe way to move forward, okay. But um, then again, okay. So then again, stroke is a very important topic for step one. Okay, and uh, once again, if we have, if you have issues with the discussion, or if we need more with discussion, what what you guys can do is you guys can solidify this information by watching the video on, on, on stroke after we are done with our discussion. Okay, so having said that, uh, let's take that break for now, and then let's come back in ten minutes. Okay.
Okay, so is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back from their break? Do we have any doctors over here? Okay, good. We have Dr. Kabasi, Dr. Jordan. Okay, you guys are back. Okay. Anyone else? Dr. Hassan, okay. Anyone else? Okay, good. So we uh, supposedly most of the doctors are back from their small break and uh, we can begin forwards. Okay, uh, first of all, be, before beginning forwards, let me apologize for taking some time for finishing neurology. The reason being is because uh, we don't want to jump from uh, pages of pages of neurology before we uh, understand that uh, everyone has uh, grasped the concepts properly. So uh, although it, it is taking us uh, some amount of time to finish neurology, but hopefully we can finish it in due time with um, proper uh, execution and understanding that we have completed by understanding that um, everything is important and by keeping in mind about all the high yields. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so having said that, let's move forward. We don't want to just, we don't want to uh, waste any more time. Okay, that's the next one. Okay, so for this lecture, what we will be doing is we will be studying about stroke, okay? So effects of stroke, okay? So basically, uh, if you, if you uh, go through my previous lecture, okay, if you go through my previous lecture about stroke, uh, the way I started discussing stroke, it's uh, by first, uh, what I did was I talked about the circle of bullets. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now again. Okay. So I'm going to discuss about the circle of Willis. One second. Okay. And uh, if I have to draw the circle of Willis, once again, okay, since, uh, uh, okay, so please feel free to unmute yourself and answer the uh, name of the arteries. Okay, so that, I, so that I can save some time. Feel free to unmute yourself and answer the name of the artery so that I can save some time. Okay, first of all, what is the name of this artery that is coming over here? Vertebra. Very good. What is the name of this artery? Uh, spinal artery. What is the name of this artery? This artery. Posterior. Very good. And then we have, we have internal carotid. Internal carotid. Okay, and from over here we have what is the name of this okay. artery? Okay, what is the name of this artery over here? Anterior cerebral anterior cerebral artery. Anterior communicating. What is the name of this artery over here? Uh, let's choose this one. Posterior communicating. Okay, we also have a little baby saying posterior communication. <laughs> <laughs> a little baby. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, Sorry. So, so we have, um, so uh, please no need to apologize. Okay, so um, everyone is welcome to our lecture. Uh, babies, elderly, pa elderly people, everyone. Okay, no problem. No need to apologize at all. Okay, so that's what it is. So this is basically the circle of Willis. Okay, so circle of Willis is uh, once again these things, and we know that uh, the vertebral arteries are coming from the aortic arches, and these are coming from the internal carotids. Okay, that's what it is. Now, what's happening is, first of all, we will discuss each and every artery by looking at the circle of Willis so that we know where the occlusions are happening. So first of all, we have the middle cerebral artery. And once again, the middle cerebral artery, oops, okay, it's this one over here. Okay, this is the middle cerebral artery. Okay, and the areas of the lesions or the middle cerebral arteries, okay, the middle cerebral arteries, as we know, that they supply mostly the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe, right, from our previous knowledge that if this is the brain, then this is the part that is supplied by middle cerebral artery, right? And that, that is where the Broca's area and the Warnix area is. So the Broca's area and the Warnix areas are, are along this side. So th this is where your, um, this is where the middle cerebral artery of occlusion is. So the patients with middle cerebral artery will get aphasia, such as Broca's aphasia or Warnix aphasia. And we will talk about this aphasia in detail. Next one is, Patients also get motor and sensory loss of upper limb and face. Patients also get 
motor and sensory loss of upper limbs and face. And why do they target the upper limb and the face? If you remember the homunculus, if you remember the homunculus, okay, we talked about the fact that there's legs over here, right? And then we have hands or uh, upper limbs, and then we have the face over here. And since the middle of the cerebral artery, it occludes this part, we have the damage to the hands and face area. Okay, so we have the upper limb and face, which is being damaged, and the temporal lobe and the Wernicke's uh, blocus area, which is being damaged, okay? Yeah, so these are the areas of the lesion. So once again, how will the patients come up with? So these are your questions. So you will get a question about a patient who has come to you with contralateral paralysis and sensory loss of the face and upper limb. So why is there both motor and sensory loss? Because it affects both the premotor cortex, primary motor cortex, and the primary somatosensory sensory and the sensory association areas. So uh, you have the uh, motor and sensory loss of face and upper limb. Along with that, the patients will also get aphasia. Okay, the patients will also get aphasia and only if it's a dominant brain that is affected once again in a left handed person, the right brain brain is dominant. If it's a right middle cerebral artery occlusion, then the patients will get aphasia. If it's a left, if it's a left handed person and if the damage is on the left sided brain, meaning on the non dominant part, the patients will get hemi neglect. As we talked about this in before, that do you guys remember? I talked about the fact in dominant parietal cortex, you get Gerstmann syndrome. In non dominant parietal cortex, you get hemi spatial neglect syndrome. That's exactly what's happening over here. Okay. So that is that. Okay. So, is uh, have you guys understood middle cerebral artery occlusion? We will go from one artery at a time. We will go from one artery at a time, okay? So next time, if you guys get a question on middle cerebral artery, uh, questions about middle cerebral artery, are you guys 100% confident that you guys can understand and answer the question? Guys? Okay, good. Okay, very good. Okay, so what, what are you trying to see? You, you are trying to see whether your patient has paralysis and sensory loss of the face and upper limb and Broca's aphasia or Warnick's aphasia or uh, talking problems. The patient has problem talking properly. Next one. Next one is anterior cerebral artery. Anterior cerebral artery. And once again, the anterior cerebral artery. Anterior cerebral artery over here, right? This one. Okay. So what is the damage that is occurring in anterior cerebral artery? Uh, you have uh, the motor and sensory loss of the lower limb. Once again, if this is the, if this is the homunculus, okay, we know that this is the legs hands, face, and anterior cerebral artery will occlude this portion. Anterior cerebral artery will occlude this portion over here, okay? So the anterior cerebral artery damage will result in uh, loss of uh, sensory and motor uh, information to the upper limb, to, to, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, to the lower limb, okay? Along with that, the patient will also get urinary incontinence. Along with that, the patient will also get urinary incontinence, okay? Okay, so uh, the I, come, I, I remember that um, I came up with a small mnemonic about how you can remember urinary incontinence with uh, anterior cerebral artery, okay? And um, the way I, I used the information in, 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 in my previous video was I said about, and I talked about an ant, okay? I talked about an end. So we have a lot of uh, we have a, we have a lot of patients or we have a lot of people who are extremely scared of ants. Okay, so there's a phobia in which people are scared of ants. So let's talk about this one guy in particular who used his lower limb to step on an ant. And as soon as he stepped on an ant, he got so scared that he peed himself. Okay, so urinary incontinence. And so what is the mnemonic? The mnemonic is basically we have a patient who is extremely scared of ant. And when he stepped on the ant and for stepping on the ant, you need your lower limb, right? And when he stepped on the ant, he got so scared that he peed himself. So urinary incontinence. And th this is one way you can remember. This is one way you can remember the association of urinary incontinence with anterior cerebral arteries. Okay, with anterior cerebral arteries, you get urinary incontinence. Are we clear on the mnemonic? Are we clear on the mnemonic? Okay, so what's happening over here? We have the patient. What did he do? stepped on an end and what happened stepped on an end and then pee. so stepped on an end and then he peed himself 
Okay, that's that's what it is. So urinary incontinence. Okay, next one. Next one is lenticulostriate artery, the famous lenticulostriate artery. Lenticulostriate artery, once again, is the branch of middle cerebral artery. And I talked about the fact how the lenticulostriate, how the lenticulostriate artery, they are responsible for uh, innervating the internal capsule and the striatum, okay, the basal ganglia. Okay, and uh, what happens with lenticulostriate arteries is, is that you get contralateral paralysis. Okay, you get contralateral paralysis over here. So this is contralateral paralysis, although this is, um, okay, you cannot see for this one, I'm trying to remove it, but contralateral paralysis. And what happens is the, those, the, middle, the, the lenticulostriate arteries are these arteries over here, okay, branches in the middle cerebral artery. And uh, what happens is you get uh, absence of the cortical signs, meaning that there is, um, there will be, ab but meaning that there will be absence of, let's say, aphasia and visual field loss. So see, these are the uh, signs that occur in uh, cortex damage, right? So we know that patients who have, let's say, paralysis of the upper limb, they also get aphasia. We know that we are talking about middle cerebral artery. If we get lower limb and then urinary incontinence, we know we are talking about anterior uh, about anterior cerebral artery. But for a lenticular stride ones, you will only get paralysis and no other sign symptoms of co of cortex damage. Meaning, you will not get neglects, you will not get aphasia, you will not get visual field loss. If there's only and only paralysis, then it's a pure motor stroke, and that is due to internal capsule. Okay, so the most common, uh, this is known as a pure motor stroke, and the most common uh, cause is due to high line arteriosclerosis, secondary due to unmanaged hypertension, and we talked about this before in micro, uh, micro uh, in uh, the charcot bouchard microaneurysm, okay, that is also one, one of the reasons of uh, ischemia stroke with the lenticular stride artery. Are we clear about uh, the lenticular stride arteries? Okay, once again, before we move on to posterior circulation, the arteries for the anterior circulations are anterior cerebral, middle cerebral, and ventricular cerebral. Now, if you have a patient who has come to you with uh, sign symptoms of uh, upper limb, uh, sign symptoms of upper limb and face loss, okay, sign symptoms of loss of innervations of the upper limb and face, along with that, the patient also has problems talking properly, which artery is occluded? middle cerebral artery. If you have a patient who has come to you with paralysis of the lower limb and the patient has urinary incontinence, what is the op what is the um, artery? Anterior cerebral artery. If you have a patient who has come to you with only paralysis of the limbs, but no other sign symptoms of cortical damage, what is the artery that is damaged? Lenticular stride artery, very good. Okay, now we will move on to posterior circulation. Okay, so let's complete our diagram for the posterior circulation. Over here, we said that this was PCA. Once again, this is superior, superior cerebellar. Okay, then we have over here, anterior inferior cerebellar. And then over here, we have posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Okay, so we have these arteries over here. So these are the arteries of the posterior circulation and also we have ASA anterior spinal artery. So let's, see what, 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 let's see what happens when you have damage of the anterior spinal artery. So the anterior spinal artery once again are, once again is this artery over here, okay? And the uh, damages are usually to the tracts because the anterior spinal artery, they supply the uh, blood, so they, they're responsible for the blood supply to the uh, to the segments of the spinal cord. And the segments of the spinal cord, which are usually damaged by anterior spinal artery occlusion are the segments which are carrying corticospinal tract. Okay, we know the corticospinal tract, which have, we, we have discussed about the tract yesterday. We won't go into any more details. Medial lemniscus, dorsal column, right? We talked about this too. And the caudal medulla, which is, the, which is basically the hypoglossal nerve, okay? So what happens is if you have damage of the corticospinal tract, if you have damage of the corticospinal tract, you will get paralysis of the upper and lower limbs altogether. Along with this, if you have damage to the medial lemniscus system, you will have decreased uh, functioning of the dorsal column, meaning the patients will have decreased proprioception. And along with this, the patients will also get hypoglossal nerve injury, okay? It's hypoglossal nerve because the anterior spinal artery, they supply the caudal medulla. The, the caudal part of the medulla and the caudal part of the medulla contains hypoglossal nerve. So this will result in ipsilateral hypoglossal. So what will happen is the patient will, the patient will, um, the patient's tongue will move towards the side of the lesion. So let's say if it's a right-sided lesion, the tongue will move to the right side. And let's say if it's a left-sided lesion, the tongue will move to the left side. Okay. So let's draw our patient. Let's see how our patient would uh, 
Let's see how our patient will look a second. No, one second, please. And um, okay. Okay, so what would happen is, let's say you have a patient, okay? So this is your patient, okay? This is the patient's tongue, okay? Which has been deviated to one side and the patient also has, okay? The patient also has flaccid, okay? So for flaccid paralysis, I'm drawing the upper limbs and lower limbs, like it's the body of a little baby meaning that there's flaccid paralysis, the patient cannot move, okay? So if you have these type of patients who cannot move their upper limbs or lower limbs, and the patient also has tongue deviation, usually we try to examine the tongue in a neurological examination to see if there's a deviation because the, um, because the midline uh, struck, because the midline position of the tongue is maintained by um, the muscles of the tongues, right? The muscles of the tongue, uh, the agonistic and antagonistic activity try to compensate each other. And then the tongue is usually in the midline all the way over here. But if the if there is um, if there is a damage to one of these sides of the muscle, the, the tongue moves towards the towards the side. Okay. So what happens is in these type of patients, if this is a left side, right side, so this is a this is a left-sided anterior spinal artery, left-sided anterior spinal artery damage. Okay. So that's what it is. And this condition is known as medial medullary syndrome. Once again, this is your patient who is medial medullary syndrome. Okay, medial medullary syndrome. Once again, what is medial, medial medullary syndrome? Paralysis of the upper and lower limbs and ipsilateral deviation of the tongue. Very simple. Okay, next one. Next one is posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Posterior inferior, <coughs> excuse me. Posterior inferior cerebellar artery is the, this artery over here, okay, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So what's happening is posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the, uh, the way I try to remember all of this information is it's, uh, it's, it's a bit, I always found it a bit difficult to recall all this information together, but so I just used the mnemonic which was given to me by first aid, and you guys can do that too. The mnemonic that uh, first aid gave us was, so before we start reading all of this, try to read the, the mnemonic first. Then the mnemonic is, don't pick a horse that can't eat. Don't pick a horse that cannot eat. So don't pick a horse. Pick a stands for pica, meaning posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So don't pick a horse, okay? Horse for hoarseness, okay? So horse for hoarseness. And um, the hoarseness occurs due to damage to the nucleus ambiguous. Okay, nucleus ambiguous, once again, contains 9, 10, 11. Okay, glossopharyngeal vagus and... Uh, accessory nerves, okay, and that can't eat. The patient also has dysphagia, also due to uh, damage of the vagus, okay. So that's all, and, and the glossopharyngeal. So we have nucleus ambiguous damage. So if you can remember, if you can remember, don't pick a horse that can eat. Don't pick a horse that can eat. You can, um, you can identify the pica lesions very easily. Along with that, with anterior inferior and posterior inferior lesions, what we have is we have, um, we have. Uh, we have damage to uh, we have damage to very similar structures. The structures that we have damage to is basically your vestibular nuclei for both. Okay, because uh, because these arteries over here, okay, these arteries, the anterior inferior, and the posterior cerebral arteries, they supply structures around this around this areas. Okay, and the, these these structural supplies of the areas are very common. So what happens is they supply uh, the they they have supply to the vestibular nuclei, okay. They also have supply to uh, the trigeminal nucleus, okay. So we have supplies to the vestibular nucleus. We have supplies to the trigeminal nucleus, okay. These are all around these areas. Along with that, there is also uh, damage to the sympathetic fibers, okay. And along with that, the patients also have damages to. Um, the patients also have damages to the spinal thalamic tract. So the lateral spinal thalamic tract, okay? So lateral spinal thalamic tract, okay? So there are basically four things which you have to memorize or keep in mind that is common to an anterior inferior and to a posterior inferior cerebral artery damage. And these are things are over here for which there is damage to these things. And these are very uh, common and uh, they overlap with the stroke, um, with the stroke symptoms. And the damages are once again to vestibular nuclei, trigeminal nuclei, spinothalamic, lateral spinothalamic tract, and another one was sympathetic fibers. But that's what it is. Okay, so if you have damage to the vestibular nuclei, the patients will get vomiting, vertigo, and nystagmus. 
okay? If you have damages to the trigeminal uh, nucleus, to the trigeminal nucleus, the patients will get uh, loss of sensations of, from the face, right? So loss of sensations from the face. Along with that, if you have damage to the sympathetic fibers, we know what happens when you have damage to the sympathetic fibers. Uh, what happens when you have damage to the sympathetic fibers? What is this uh, condition called? This, this also occurs in Horner syndrome. Okay, so this is Horner syndrome, very good. So what is, uh, what are you looking for in a patient with Horner syndrome? What are the three things to look out for in a patient with Horner syndrome? Ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. Okay, very good. Ptosis, meiosis, not meiosis. Meiosis is, meiosis and meiosis is not the same thing, but um, okay. So meiosis, that is very good. So ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis. Okay, so that's what it is. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for answering the questions. And if you have damage to the lateral spinothalamic tract, what will happen? You will, what will happen is you will get loss of uh, pain and temperature sensation from the uh, from from the body. And always remember, if you have loss of trigeminal nucleus, then there will be loss of pain and temperature sensation from ipsilateral face because the trigeminal nucleus uh, supplies from the ipsilateral side. And if you have damage to the lateral spinothalamic tract, we talked about the fact how the tract crosses, right? So you will have loss of pain and temperature sensation from the contralateral side of the body. Contralateral side of the body. Okay. Okay. So we have posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which presents with, once again, posterior inferior cerebellar artery presents with, don't pick a horse that can't eat. So horse for hoarseness. So the patient has hoarseness that can't eat, meaning the patient has dysphagia. So hoarseness, dysphagia. Then this four structure damage, that is vomiting vertigo nystagmus, ipsilateral loss of pain, temperature sensation from the face, Horner syndrome, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis, and the patient has loss of temperature sensations from the contralateral side of the body. And along with that, I will also discuss anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Anterior inferior cerebellar artery is uh, important because over here, there is a very important structure which this supplies, anterior inferior cerebral artery. And this structure is known as a lateral pons. Lateral pons has the facial nucleus, okay? The nucleus of the face, so facial nucleus. So for anterior inferior cerebral artery damage, there will be, once again, vomiting vertigo nystagmus for vestibular nucleus damage because it's the same, trigeminal nucleus, ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature sensation from the face, lateral spinal tract for contralateral pain and temperature sensation loss of the body, sympathetic fibers for Horner syndrome, ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis, and damage of facial nucleus for which the patient will get facial paralysis. So the patient will not have dysphagia, hoarseness, and stroke, a hoarseness like the one they had for pica, for ICA, A-I-C-A, meaning anterior inferior cerebellar artery damage, they will have they will have loss of facial sens sensations. And I'm pretty sure first aid has another mnemonic for this, meaning that another mnemonic which first aid used was facial droop means ICAS pooped. Okay, here you go. Facial droop, meaning if there is drooping of the facial, meaning there's pooping of the ICA. Pooping meaning that there is a loss of or there's damage of the ICA or anterior inferior cerebellar artery damage. And these two conditions, the one for uh, posterior inferior and the one for anterior inferior, this is known as lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. And this is known as lateral pontine syndrome. Okay, once again, so, so some rapid questions and some rapid answers. Okay, rapid questions and rapid answers. So feel free to unmute yourselves once again. Okay, feel free to unmute yourself once again. Okay, so if you have a patient who has come to you with uh, contralateral with uh, loss of sensations of the upper limb and face, and now the patient has a uh, problem talking. What is the artery that is damaged? MCA. If you have a patient who has loss of sensation of the lower limbs, and the patient has urinary incontinence, what is the damage? Anterior cerebral, Anterior cerebral artery. Very good. If you have a patient who has a pure motor stroke and no signs of cortical damage, what is the artery that is occluded? Ventricular arteries. Next one. If you have a patient who has come to you with a paralysis of the arms and legs, along with that, the patient has a tongue deviation to the right side. What is the artery that Anterior is that? Spinal. Right side. Spinal artery. Anterior spinal artery. 
Cheers, 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 right side or left side? The tongue deviated where? Sorry. <laughs> the tongue is deviated to the right side. Okay. Right, so right, side. Side. right, side. right, right side. side. Very good. Okay. Next one is if you have a patient who has come to you with a problem talking, problem eating, patient has vomiting vertigo and stigmas, patient cannot feel the ipsilateral side of the face, patient has contralateral side of pain and temperature loss. Along with that, the patient has ptosis, meiosis, and hydrosis. Same symptoms, along with the fact that patient does not have dysphagia and horses, the patient has uh, Bell's palsy. What is the artery that is damaged? Inferior cerebral artery. Okay, so those are Bell's palsy with Ica and Pike. Okay. okay, thank you. I'm just going to mute you again and ask you later. Thank you so much, everyone, for. Next one. Next one is uh, basilar artery. Okay, basilar artery and basilar artery is, is this artery over here. Okay, the vertebral and the two vertebrals meet together to form one basilar artery. Okay, basilar artery damage is an extremely, extremely, um, it's an extremely uh, interesting uh, stroke. So what happens is over here, you have damage to midbrain pons and medulla, meaning that you have damage to the brainstem. Along with that, you have damage to the cortical spinal and the cortical bulbar tracts, meaning the, the, the tracts which goes through over here. Okay, I'm going to use a different color. This is getting a bit confusing. Okay, so the tracts which go through over here, these tracts are damaged. Okay, along with that, the patient also have damage of the of the brainstem. So we know the brainstem has uh, midbrain pons and medulla. So we have damage of all these structures. Along with that, the patient also has damage to the ocular nerve nuclei and PPRF, ocular nerve nuclei and PPRF. And once again, we know what happens when you have damage to the PPRF, you look towards the side of the paralysis. Okay, but what happens is over here, the patient does not have one side paralysis. The patient has quadriplegia, meaning the patient has paralysis of all four limbs, quadriplegic, okay? But the reticular activating system is spared. The reticular activating system is spared, meaning that the, the, the reticular activating system is still spared. So the patient is not unconscious, even though the patient cannot move, the patient can see what's going on. So it's an extremely scary condition to be in. And it's a very, uh, unfortunately, it's a very um, uh, upsetting condition even for the physician because you will feel really bad for your patient, but there's not much really you can do. And this condition is known as locked in syndrome. It's as if the patient is locked in his own body uh, you want to move something, but you can't, and th that feeling should be absolutely horrible. Uh, let's say this is the patient, once again, lying down on the bed, okay? This is the patient on the bed, okay? This is the patient who's lying down on the bed. The only thing the patient can move are, the only thing that the patient can move is, uh, the, are their eyes. And then again, even if they want to move their eyes, they can move their eyes only in upward direction, okay? So there's loss of horizontal movement, but but vertical movement is spared. So if, you, if this is the patient's eyes, the only thing that the patient can, uh, the only thing that the patient can move are the eyes and the eyes can move only in the upward direction. Okay, and th this is a very um, devastating kind of condition to be in. Okay, and this is known as locked in syndrome. And it's as if you are locked in your own um, body. Okay, so locked in syndrome. So basilar artery damage is known as locked in syndrome. So the patient is unconscious. The patient knows exactly what's going on or what is being asked. Only the problem is the patient cannot answer anything or answer. Uh, the only way they can answer is or if they can move their eyes or close their eyelids. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, uh, do you guys know another condition which uh, has similar sign symptoms to locked in syndrome? Let's see who has been working in their emergency department. Another condition in which the patients have the same symptoms, sign symptoms of locked in syndrome. What is this condition called? Where does this condition occur? Anyone? Have you guys heard about pontine myelinolysis? Anyone? Very good. What is pontine myelinolysis, please? What is pontine myelinolysis? Anyone, to the doctors who have said yes. We have Dr. Adhanam, Dr. Ibrahim. Do we have Dr. Ibrahim? Okay, and then we have Dr. Hussam. Rapid correction of hyponatremia, very good. 
So rapid infusion, if you have a patient, once again, okay, poor sodium management, very good. Okay, so this is an, uh, this is an information for all the physicians right now, okay? So if you guys ever receive a patient in your hospital or in your clinic or in your emergency department, who has hyponatremia, okay? We know that the normal level of sodium in the body is 135 to 145. If you have a patient who comes to you with a sodium level of let's say 100, okay? And you want to correct that sodium level, even you want to correct that sodium level. If you try to correct that sodium level very fast, very soon, you will cause a very uh, important and a devastating damage to your patient. What you will cause is, you will cause lateral or I mean bilateral pontine myelinolysis. You will, res uh, this will cause in a myelin deprivation of the pons and the patients will get locked in syndrome. The patients will get the same same syndrome, which is known as locked in syndrome in which the patient cannot move their body or only their eyes. Okay, so please, okay, the next time when you correct your patients put uh, sodium, be extremely careful and try to correct the sodium very slowly. Yes, Dr. Mustam, what is your question? Bilateral brainstem tumor. Uh, temporary, no, it's not temporary, it's permanent. Myelinolysis, there's complete demyelination of the pons, okay? It's permanent, it's a permanent devastating damage, okay? And it's a very common mistake made by doctors throughout the world, okay? So be careful. Uh, bilateral brainstem tumor does not get all the signs symptoms of locked-in syndrome as much as uh, basilar artery stroke and Pontine myelinolysis has. Okay, I hope that answers your question, doctor. And uh, the next one that we will move forward is uh, posterior cerebral artery damage. This is extremely easy to understand that posterior cerebral artery is, uh, uh, is responsible for uh, your vision. So the lesion is in the occipital lobe. And what will happen is you will get contralateral hemianopia with macular sparing. Because why is the macular spared? The macular spared because the macula is supplied by another artery. What is the name of the another artery that supplies the macula? <clears throat> Very good, MCA. So the macula is supplied by MCA. That, that's, that's what it is. Okay, so we have completed stroke. Are we clear on the are we clear on stroke? Are we clear on stroke? Do we have any questions from stroke? Do we have any questions from stroke? Guys, anyone? Do we have any questions? Yes, no, no. Very good. Okay, no. So what my question to you guys is, if you have patients with anterior inferior and posterior inferior cerebral artery damage, what are the four structures that are common to these two strokes? What are the four structures that are common to these two strokes? Anyone? Vestibular nucleus, then? Sympathetic. Then? Lateral spinal dynamic tract. Okay, good. Okay, trigeminal nucleus, very good. Okay, we had a question from one physician. How can I differentiate between MCA and anterior spinal artery in question. It's easy, it's extremely easy, okay? So if you have a patient who has MCA stroke, the patient will have paralysis with problems with talking properly, meaning aphasia. If you have a patient who has anterior spinal artery damage, the patient will have damage to the hypoglossal nerve, so the tongue will deviate. So tongue deviation, medial medullary syndrome, anterior spinal artery. If there is talking problems with paralysis, the patient has MCA stroke, is that clear? Dr. Um, Iman? Okay, perfect. Okay, good. Okay, next one. Next one is known as a central post-stroke pain syndrome. Central post-stroke pain syndrome is basically a neuropathic pain which occurs due to lesions of the thalamus. Okay, this occurs due to lesions of the thalamus. And what happens is you have initial paresthesia followed by, so initially there is weakness followed by Allodynia, okay, allodynia. These are ordinary painless stimuli, which causes pain. I mean, so what happens is uh, at times the nerves uh, try to uh, reform, right? So, okay, so what's happening is, okay, let's draw this out for you guys so that you guys understand exactly what central post stroke syndrome is. Okay, so let's say this is a nerve, okay? Now there is ish ischemia and then ischemia, the brain is damaged. If the brain is damaged, then there is damage to this nerve. 
okay there is damage to this nerve over here right so what happens right now is uh, this nerve over here now it tries to uh, go grow back now this nerve this tries to go back and when this nerve tries to go grow back this nerve when this tries to go back this initial baby nerves which are trying to go back are very very um very very alert and aware okay so what happens is so when these nerves when they try to go back these are very alert and aware so whenever you have any stimulus okay whenever these nerves get stimulated since they are baby nerves and they get they're alert and aware all the time these uh painless stimulus can cause pain okay this painless stimulus can cause pain and also these nerves are not well coordinated properly since once again they're baby nerves okay what happens is you have lesions on the contralateral side you have lesions uh, i mean you have altered sensations on the contralateral side okay can i get one minute please Okay, perfect. So uh, that's what it is. Okay, so are you guys clear about central post stroke pain syndrome? What's happening over here? You have a nerve damage and after you have a nerve damage, the nerve tries to go to grow back. And these baby nerves are very, very stimulated and aware. So what happens is with, the, with these nerves, even with a small painless stimulus, this causes pain and this is known as allodynia. Are we clear about central post stroke syndrome? Yes, no, do, do, we, do I have any answers? Not really, okay, good. So that is even an answer. So, good. so that's a good answer. There was, this will allow me to explain it to you again. Okay, so this is a nerve. If this is damaged in stroke, the nerve tries to go to grow back. The nerve tries to grow back, okay? When these nerves, when they try to grow back in their initial stage, nerves are very aware and their uh, nerves are very aware and nerves are very, um, nerves are easily stimulated right so if you have any type of uh, if you have any type of uh, stimulus let's say if you have a painless stimulus in which you tap someone tap someone very gently on their uh, on their uh, on their body what this will do is this will result in a pain usually it should not cause any pain but if it does cause any pain in a patient after stroke this pain is known as central post stroke pain are we clear okay next one Next one is diffuse axonal injury. Okay, next one is diffuse axonal injury. Okay, so diffuse axonal injury is caused by traumatic shearing forces during rapid acceleration or deceleration. So what happens is, let's say, let's say, okay, let's say that, um, okay, this is, let's say a bike. Okay, so this, this is the bike. This is the patient who is going to be a patient. The patient has not become a patient as of yet, okay? So let's say this patient is going at a bike at a very high speed, okay? And then after uh, at a very high speed, what's happening is this, this bike comes to a sudden halt. Okay, this bike comes to a sudden halt, the bike suddenly stops and the patient, what this will do, the, the patient will move forward, okay, due to momentum. The patient will move forward due to momentum and then the momentum is corrected and then the patient will move backward again. So this rapid acceleration and deceleration will result in a brain injury in which parts of the brain will get sheared out. I mean, you have white matters inside the brain, such as corona radiata, and this will uh, this coron this uh, white matters will get sheared out, and this will result as multiple lesions, as you can see over here. So as you can see that these lesions over here, multiple lesions, which shows punctate hemorrhage, meaning that there's hemorrhage involving the white matter. Okay, this results in an uh, this results in a in an injury known as a diffuse axonal injury. Okay, and this is very devastating because the patients can be uh, either in a coma or in a vegetative state, persistent vegetative state. 
So that's what it is. Okay. So what is diffuse axonal injury? If you have a patient who has a sudden acceleration or deceleration, this will result in breakage of the white matter tracts. And this will be represented as puncted hemorrhages like this. And the patient can be in coma or the patient can be in a vegetative state. Okay, are we clear about, um, about diffuse axonal injury? Everyone? Are you guys bored of studying neurology? Okay, because when I, so because there's the time from which I start realizing you are not uh, responding enough, I realize that you guys are exhausted. Is, is everyone exhausted? Okay, good. Okay, so no one is exhausted. That's very good. Okay, so we have, so that's what it is. Okay, so, okay, next one. So let's start with aphasia. Okay, so far, have you guys had any difficulty understanding the lecture? Okay, pace of the lecture, okay. Are we doing a good job? Do you want us to change the pace? Go faster, go slower? Okay, good. Okay, okay. Please let us know if you have any feedback, okay? We will act accordingly. Okay, next one. Okay, so, uh, so the next thing which we want to talk about is aphasia, okay? Aphasia. Aphasia is basically uh, difficulty in uh, talking, okay? And dysarthia. Dysarthia is basically inability, meaning motor inability, meaning that you cannot move your muscles to produce the speech that you need. Okay, so this is dysarthia and this is aphasia. Both of them are different. Okay, so what is aphasia? Aphasia is basically a higher order language de deficit. Okay, so higher order language deficit. And this usually occurs due, due to damage to the dominant, uh, to, to the dominant brain. And, and especially in a population like our population of the world, majority of us are right-handed. So the majority of our brains are left-sided. Majority of our brains that are dominant are left-sided brains. Okay, so uh, that's that. Okay, so in, in the left-sided, uh, so in a left, in a right-sided human being, the left-sided brain is dominant, and if there is damage to that dominant part of the cerebral hemisphere, especially the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area, you get aphasia. Okay, and uh, if you get uh, if there is problem with uh, performing uh, motor movements, okay, due to any issues. The problem that the patient has is known as dysarthia, meaning that the patient cannot move their uh, muscles in order to produce the speech they need. Okay, okay. So this is a very important thing which we are going to master right now. Okay, this is a very important thing which we are going to master right now. Okay. So first of all, if you have Broca's aphasia, okay. So we talked about uh, Broca's aphasia and Warnick's aphasia, and okay. Once again. Okay, so okay, so this, this brain over here, as you can see that this is the region of the Broca's area. The region of the Broca's area, this region is in the inferior frontal gyrus, okay? So from the frontal gyrus in the inferior part of the frontal lobe, so this is the frontal lobe, okay? Once again, this is the frontal lobe. From the frontal lobe, we have the frontal gyrus. In the frontal gyrus, we have the inferior part of the frontal gyrus, and this area is known as Broca's area. Okay, this area is known as Broca's area. This area is important for um, this area is important for uh, producing the speech, or let's say the fact that I'm talking right now. My Broca's area is activated, and my Broca's area is uh, letting my um, is letting my uh, premotor cortex know. Okay, so you have your premotor cortex, which is sending impulses to your muscles of the tongue and your muscles of the face. Okay, and the my thought process is being uh, made into words in the Broca's area. And the fact that I'm talking right now, this this information is sent all the way to for the premotor cortex, the primary motor cortex, by the white matters, about let's say coronary radiatus. And from there, we have I have impulses going to my muscles of the face and by the muscles of my tongue, and I'm talking as of right now. Okay, but what happens is if I have damage to this Broca's area, if I have damage to the Broca's area, what would happen is I would be talking absolutely gibberish. The, but the difference is I would know what I want to talk about. So let's say right now my goal is to teach you guys about aphasia. 
okay? I would know that, I, I mean, I mean, my brain knows that I want to talk about aphasia and I know I want to talk about aphasia, but I just can't. Meaning I'd be talking absolutely gibberish, like rah, 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 something like this, absolutely gibberish. It would not make any sense, okay? So what this will do is this will frustrate me and I will be extremely frustrated. Okay, so you would be, so a patient with Broca's aphasia, they're extremely frustrated because they know what they want to talk about, but the problem is they can't. That's, that's what, that, that is known as Broca's aphasia. Okay, we have another one that is known as Warnick's aphasia. Warnick's aphasia is basically in the, so you have the temporal lobe in which you have the temporal gyrus. Okay, so this is the superior part of the temporal gyrus of the temporal lobe. So in the temporal lobe, you have the temporal gyrus, and this is the superior part of the temporal gyrus. And this is known as the Warnicke's area. And this area is also uh, associated with another type of aphasia. This is known as Warnicke's aphasia. Okay, this is known as Warnicke's aphasia. So what's happening is when you want to talk, okay, let, okay, so let's go from when you want to talk, and then we can break it down once again. This is the frontal lobe. You are, you are thinking about something, okay? Then you want to make that thought into an idea and then that idea is made into an action and then you execute that action. So you're, right now you're right, your thought is to talk, okay? So I, I was thinking of the fact how great it would be if I can teach you guys about aphasia. So I, um, I thought about this. Then I came up with an idea about what I want to talk about. Okay, so I have made an idea. Now I will send my impulse to the Warnicke's area, meaning that this will get processed in the Warnicke's area. From the Warnicke's area, this impulse will go to the Broca's area, okay? So my ideas are going from the Warnicke's area, meaning my, my uh, talking, um, meaning the fact that what I want to talk about, this is processed in the Warnicke's area. And then from there, this will go to the Broca's area. How? This will go to the Broca's area by a fasciculus known as arcuate fasciculus, arcuate fasciculus. Arcuate fasciculus is, is another type of white matter. Okay, so another, so from the Broca's area, this will go from the premotor, primary motor, and then I will move my face and my tongue and I will start talking. So this is the whole process of talking. So the, just as how the Broca's area is important for, for letting me move my tongue and my, fa and, and my um, face accordingly to talk, the Warnicke's area is responsible for letting my Broca's area know about what to talk about. Okay, so my Warnicke's area is letting my Broca's area know exactly what I want to talk about. So right now, if you have damage of the Warnicke's area, you will be talking about absolutely nonsense. You would be talking about nonsense things, literally nonsense. It will not make any sense. So this is known as Warnicke's aphasia, or this is known as word salad. But keep in mind that for people with Broca's aphasia, they will not be able to talk, so they will talk gibberish. But people with Warnicke's area, they will be able to talk fluently, but they would not make any sense. They would not make any sense. If I could come up with um, one second. Okay. Just uh, give me one second to show you guys. This is, this is extremely interesting. Just let, give me one second to show you guys what Broca's aphasia is. Years ago. Okay. And, and what did you used to do? Um, well, um, worked um, on a desk, um, seven, seven sales. Okay. Did you guys realize how difficult it was for him to say a certain word? Yes or no? Okay. And worldwide and very good. Yeah. Okay. And who are you looking at over there when you turn That's your head? That's my wife. Okay. And why is she helping you to talk? Um, she's a speech. Um, so you guys get the idea of Broca's aphasia, so that's what it is. Okay, let's look at a patient with Warnicke's aphasia. Hi, Byron, how are you? I'm happy, are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stayed with the water over here at the moment and talked with the people for them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. What did you guys realize? 
did you realize that this guy over here with warning is aphasia, he was asked about how he was doing and then he answered completely different. He answered something which makes absolutely no sense. Okay. Save in the moment. He'll water very soon for him. Good luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to We use will sort it right here and they'll save their hands right there for them. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> okay. So you guys get the idea. It's completely irrelevant. It makes absolutely no sense. And this is known as Warnicke's aphasia. Okay, so that's what it is. So Warnicke's aphasia, that's what Warnicke's aphasia is. Okay, so what's happening over here is you are, so you get Warnicke's aphasia and then you get Broca's aphasia. Okay, but another thing is you get another type of aphasia that is known as conduction aphasia. Okay, so conduction aphasia. Conduction aphasia is basically caused by damage to the arcuate fasciculus. And I told you how the Warnick's area, uh, it, uh, it, it works with the Broca's area by sending impulses to the ar arcuate fasciculus. And if there is damage of the arcuate, arcuate fasciculus, you have this aphasia called conduction aphasia. Okay, so right now we will be talking, we will be focusing on these three. And we would be mastering this table, okay? We will be mastering this table with the help of, uh, so the thing is, if you can master this table and if you can draw this table in one, let's say 10 seconds, okay? This will allow you to answer every question about uh, Broca's aphasia and Warnick's aphasia, okay? So the way that we will, um, we will answer this, uh, we will complete this question, we will complete this table is, first of all, we will write, we, we will write GC, okay, PC, GC, PC, okay, GC, PC, okay, just bear with me, please, GC and PC, then we will write, okay, one, one second, GC, PC, after that, we would write FS, not FS, NFS, okay, Okay, just some words. Okay, after that, what we would what we would do is we would draw draw a table, very easily. Okay, and after we draw this table, all we are going to do is draw this line through the middle, and you guys know where I'm going with this. We have PR, GR. Okay, and then, okay, then we have. B, C, W, T, uh, sorry, B, C, W, and M, M, S. Okay, so it's easy for me to do, do this. Okay, it's easy for me to do this because I have practiced doing this for a long period of time. Okay, so I can do it very easily. And the reason why I can do this and the reason why I train myself to learn it this way, it's because you will get so many questions from Broca's aphasia and Warnicke's aphasia that it, it, at, at times when your brain is tired from doing an eight hour long USNLE step one exam, okay, you will not be able to answer properly about which aphasia they're talking about because you have six aphasias that you need to master. Okay, you have Broca's, Warnicke's, conduction aphasia, transcortical motor, transcortical sensory, and transcortical mixed, okay? So there are so many aphasias and so many sign symptoms that you have to look out for if you do not have this table memorized that more often than none, you will get your questions wrong about aphasia. So the reason why First Aid did this and they, and they ask you to uh, memorize this table, it's because when whenever you get a question about aphasia, you get a rough paper in your uh, actual exam. If you can, manage to get 10 seconds off of your hand and you draw this table out very quickly, you can manage to answer the question perfectly each and every time. So let's say you have drawn this, you have drawn this table out in your rough paper and in the future of the exam, if you receive another question, you can just refer to this table and answer that question perfectly because during the whole course of your exam, you will get at least um, three to four questions from aphasia. Okay, so what is GCPC? GC is good comprehension, PC is poor comprehension, FS, FS is fluent speech, NFS is non-fluent speech. Okay, very easy. Good comprehension, poor comprehension. Fluent speech, non-fluent speech. Poor repetition, good repetition. Poor repetition and good repetition. And, and uh, the problem with, uh, with my students were whenever I tried to uh, uh, make them memorize these tables, they, uh, they could not memorize BCEW and MMS. 
okay, BCW and MMS. So um, the reason why it was easy for me once again to do this was because I kept on doing it for a long period of time. So if there was a way for which you guys can do the same thing, which I did, and I also told my previous students the same thing, that BCW, MMS, if you can guys, if you guys can keep on doing this for this, for the, um, for a long period of time, you guys can master this table very easily. Okay, so can I give you guys uh, one second to master this and then I will ask you whether I would ask one of the doctors to participate so that they can help me um, answer the questions. Okay, BCW, MMS and GCPC, FS, NFS, PR, GR, okay. If anyone is ready, please let me know. Please unmute yourself and let me know. If anyone is ready to rewrite this table. Anyone? This is very easy, okay? Good comprehension, poor comprehension, fluent speech, non-fluent speech, poor repetition, good repetition. That's it, no, nothing else. After that, we have BCW and MMS. Is anyone ready? Yeah, that. Okay. okay, good. Dr. Hassan is done. Okay, Dr. Kameshwari is done. Okay, so, okay. So, Dr. Hassan, could you please unmute yourself? Yes, doctor. Hello. Okay, perfect. So help me draw the diagram once again. What are the first things that I have to write over here? Um, fluent speech and non-fluent speech below. Okay, FS, NFS. Then, then on the top, uh, good comprehension and poor comprehension. GCPC. Then? Then you make uh, like three, two columns, yeah, three columns. Okay, then? Uh, then you put uh, oblique line. Oblique line. Yeah, then you, then? yeah, you start from the point that you started. Uh, you can put here PR and PR. G, GR. GR, okay, next one. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for letting uh -huh. me complete the table. Next one goes to Dr. Kameshwari. Uh, would you be kind enough to unmute yourself, please, and answer what do I have to write or in these parts of the table? Yeah, uh, so good. GP and fluent speech, uh, it's um, conduction um, aphasia. C. C, yeah. And then uh, for non-fluent speech and um, GC, there is broca's aphasia on the top, and there is motor aphasia, transcortical motor aphasia on the bottom. Okay. And then PC and FS on the top, it's vernix aphasia. And on the bottom, it's sensory aphasia. Okay. And then the one where it's PC and non-fluent speech, it's uh, transient cortical mixed aphasia. MMS, thank you so much for participating. And uh, this is BCW and MMS. Okay. So, uh, uh, okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Hassam and Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Kameshwari for participating. So are you guys... <clears throat> Are the rest of you guys confident that you guys can do the same thing? Okay. BCW, MMS, and then GCPC, FSNFS, PRGR. Okay. I know it's easy for me to say it because I have, uh, I, I, I am teaching you guys. I won't be giving the exam. You are the one who will be giving the exam. So I know it will be hard for you. But if with practice comes perfection, so keep on practicing this. Okay. Keep on practicing this. Also, please don't forget about macule patch papule plaque. Okay, that is another tongue twister. And macule patch papule plaque. Okay, these are some of the things that I asked you guys to keep on practicing every day so that you guys can do this in a, so that there will be absolutely no problem with you guys remembering this for a long period of time. Okay, so this is another one of those things. Okay, so right now let's talk a little bit more. So now we have Broca's aphasia. So the problem is, in your question, you will get a patient who will come to you that the patient's attendant will tell you that your patient has, that your patient has non-fluent speech. They, they will tell you that the patient is talking about, the patient wants to talk about something, but the patient cannot talk. 
properly. Uh, but the fact is the patient has good comprehension, meaning that the patient can understand what they want to talk about. The patient knows what, what uh, the patient wants to talk about. So the patient is also frustrated. So whenever you get a patient who has good comprehension, meaning the patient knows what they want to talk about, but the patient cannot talk properly as we saw in the video. The problem and uh, the diagnosis is, and most more often than none, you will be asked about the diagnosis. The diagnosis is broca's aphasia. Okay, next one. If you have a patient who has come to you with poor comprehension, like in this, in this guy over here, there, there is poor comprehension. Okay, okay, poor, poor comprehension, like this guy over here. The, this guy does not know what the what what he's being asked. Okay, he is being asked. Right there. Okay, so he is being he's being asked one thing, and then he is absolutely um, under, uh, he is absolutely answering a different thing. So this is known as poor comprehension. But his uh, his speech is very fluent. Okay, so he has a very fluent speech. So his fluent speech and poor comprehension is your diagnosis for Wernicke's aphasia. Okay. And your next one is, if you have a patient who has good comprehension, okay, but poor, but fluent speech, but the patient has poor repetition, okay, the patients have poor, poor repetition. And in all of these, even in Broca's aphasia and Warnick's aphasia, the repetition is pretty poor, meaning that if you ask the patient to repeat something, okay, let's say you, you give him a, you give him a sentence, let's say, I like looking at bright colors and you ask him to repeat this, he will not, this guy with warning aphasia will fail. This guy with, with broca's aphasia will fail because he cannot say the word. And this guy will fail because he cannot understand the word. And this guy over here, although he has a fluent speech and he understands what he wants to talk about, but he will not be able to repeat it. Okay, so he would, he would talk about something uh, which he would try really hard to, to repeat the word or the sentence which you have just provided for him but he would fail to do so. And if you have a patient who has poor repetition, but fluent speech and good comprehension, the aphasia which the patient has is conduction aphasia and the damage is due to the arcuate fasciculus. Are we clear about these three? Okay. Okay. Next one. Next one is good repetitions. Okay, next one is good repetition. So let's say right now over here, you have a patient who knows what he wants to talk about. So he, his comprehension is good, okay? But the patient's uh, f uh, speech is uh, not fluent, okay? So how can you understand that these patients have uh, Broca's aphasia or transcortical motor aphasia? Transcortical motor aphasia, it's, it's basically, what, what is transcortical motor, okay? So basically, if this is the brain, okay? Okay, one second. Let's say if this is the brain over here, okay? And we know that the Broca's area is somewhere over here, okay? So, so in these patients, the damage is not in the Broca's, the damage is some, somewhere close to the Broca's, okay? So the, the damage is not over here, the damage is surrounding the Broca's. So this is known as transcortical motor aphasia. So in patients with transcortical motor aphasia, where the damage is not directly to the Broca's, but to the structure surrounding the Broca's, the patients will have good repetition, meaning that the patients can repeat each and every word, but the patient will have some, the patient will need some time. The, these patients will need some time to repeat the words. And also the patients will understand what uh, they are being asked. So their uh, comprehension is also pretty good. So with good comprehension, good repetition, but non-fluent speech, the condition is transcortical motor. Same way, if the patient have a poor comprehension, uh, fluent speech instead of Warnicke's if the patient can repeat everything, okay? This is known as transcortical sensory aphasia. Transcortical sensory aphasia, meaning that, once again, if this is the Warnicke's area, meaning that, let's say, uh, this is the Warnicke's area and these patients, the Warnicke's area is direct, directly not damaged. There is damage of this area surrounding the Warnicke's area. So this is known as transcortical sensory. Okay, and uh, we also have, uh, <clears throat> We also have transcortical mixed. Transcortical mixed is basically Broca's area is not damaged. Warnicke's area is not damaged. Arcuate fasciculus is, arc, arc, arcuate fasciculus is not damaged. 
what what he, what damaged here is are the surrounding watershed areas, meaning that you have watershed areas between the supply of anastomosis, between anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, and if there's damage to those structures, then you get transcortical mix. And the easiest way how you can identify all of these aphasias are, now let's say you have a patient who has come to you with poor comprehension, uh, uh, fluent speech, but the patient has good repetition and the question will mention each and every one of these things, either directly or via sign symptoms. And if you can break the questions down very easily and you have this table mem uh, memorized or drawn, okay, you can answer each and every one of this aphasia confidently each and every time, okay? If any one of you are thinking of any other way that you can um, do the aphasia questions, okay, you're more than welcome to do so, but this is the only way where you will have 100% confidence and 0% error, okay? 0% error of making a mistake. So, so there will be a very less amount of error which you can make if you have this table memorized, okay? Are you guys ready for some questions according to the aphasia? After that, we go forward. Okay, so who wants to participate in the questions, please? Who wants to participate in the questions? Okay. Okay. So uh, you don't have to unmute yourself. You can just use the chat box so that everyone can see. Okay. And everyone can answer. No problem. Okay. So uh, what I would be doing right now is I would be giving you guys five seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Please do not uh, look at the book and draw the table by yourself and let me know by saying done. Okay, 10 seconds. I will give you guys 10 seconds to draw the table in a piece of paper. And after you guys are done drawing the table, write done. And I will ask you the questions. Please participate. Okay. You do not have to talk. You do not have to chat. At least draw the table and write done. Good. Okay. Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, good. Okay, now, the question is, if you have a patient right now, okay, okay, good, okay, done, no. okay, good. So right now, if you have a patient who has come to you with poor comprehension, non-fluent speech, good repetition, okay, once again, poor comprehension, non-fluent speech, good repetition. Mixed, very good, transcortical, mixed. It's not transcortical motor. If you have the table drawn perfectly, this should have been easily answered. Transcortical mixed, MMS. Okay, the first question was a hard one. That's why I asked you to see if everyone has drawn the table perfectly. To everyone who has drawn the table, uh, my question was poor comprehension, non-fluent speech, and good repetition. To everyone who has answered wrong, please check their table to see what mistakes they made. Did you guys realize the mistake you made? Okay, missed, okay, okay, missed, okay. So you guys realize the mistakes you made, good. Next next one, next one is if you have a patient who has come to you with good comprehension, non-fluent speech, good repetition. Motor. Okay, okay, good. Uh, we had another question from one other physician, which one is mixed and which one is motor? The M that is close to Brocus is motor because uh, motor area is close to the Brocus area, okay? MMS. The one that is close to the M, though that is close to the B is motor, okay? So th this is a transcortical motor aphasia. Now, if you have a patient who has come to you with poor comprehension, fluent speech, and good repetition, once again, poor comprehension, fluent speech, good repetition. Very good, okay? Very good. Do you guys realize how easy it is to answer once you have the table memorized or the table drawn? Okay. Uh, no matter how many times or how many ways I want to confuse you guys, I cannot. Okay. Because you have the table in front of you. Next one. If you have a patient who has come to you with good comprehension, non-fluent speech, poor repetition. Brokers. Very good. If you have a patient who has come to you with poor comprehension, fluent speech, poor repetition. Poor comprehension, fluent speech, poor repetition. Warning keys. 
if you have a patient who has come to you with good comprehension, fluent speech, good comprehension, good comprehension, fluent speech, and poor repetition. Poor repetition. Conjunction. Okay. Okay. Not a single one of you have answered wrong. And do you guys realize how complicated the questions were? Okay. Okay. Now, okay. Now try to answer the question without looking at the table and you will realize how complicated it is. Okay. Everyone close your page. Please do not look at your page anymore. And I will show you how scary it is when I ask you the questions and you guys will get I, I'm pretty sure you guys will have a very difficult time answering. Okay. Have you guys closed down the page? Okay, good. Now let's see. Okay. If you have a patient who has come to you with problems with uh, repetition, the, the patient also has problem understanding words, and the, but the patient can talk fluently. What is the diagnosis? If you do not look at the... Okay. One of you are one of you saying brokers, another one is saying warranties, brokers. Okay. So, okay, so now we have, we are having different answers, okay? And this is bound to happen. Okay, next one. If, if you have a patient with poor comprehension, good repetition, non-fluent speech. Don't look at the table. Okay, every one of you is, every one of you are wrong. It's mixed, transportable mixed, okay. Okay, so the reason why you guys were wrong was because because you guys took my word and did not look at the table. So the thing is, if you do not look at the table and try to answer from just your understanding, it will be extremely difficult for you. This was the whole reason why I made you guys uh, did not, why, why I made you guys not look at the table and answer the questions. But once again, if you have the table made and I ask you the questions, you guys can easily answer it. So are we clear on aphasia? Once again, GCPC, FSNFS, GRPR, and then BCW and LMS. Okay. Okay. At least draw, try to draw this once a day or twice or once every two days so that you guys can master it. And even and during the exam, you guys can draw it really easily. And you guys can answer the questions. Okay. Okay. So this is what it is. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, so that this is what it is. Okay, well, so this is the aphasia, and then we're done with the aphasia. Okay, now, next one is aneurysm. Okay, next one is aneurysm. Okay, so right now we will be talking about aneurysm, and what is aneurysm? Aneurysms are basically abnormal dilatation of an artery due to weakening of the vessel wall. So if there is a weakening of the vessel wall and there is dilatation of an artery, this is this condition is known as aneurysm. Okay. And the uh, sacular aneurysm over here is basically this sac-like structure. So as you can see, we have this sac-like structure over here, and this is called sacular aneurysm. Okay. We have another question, one question to the mixed. What are the symptoms? The symptoms of mixed transcortical aphasia is basically poor comprehension. The patient will not be able to speak properly, but the patient can repeat everything. Are we clear? Okay. Next one. Sacular aneurysm, once again. So sacular aneurysm is basically the sac-like aneurysm or dilatation of the vessel. This is also known as a berry aneurysm, okay, because this looks like a berry, okay? Okay, uh, berry is a fruit, by the way. So, so, so berry aneurysm, okay? And this occurs at the bifurcation of the circle of this, okay? So the, the, uh, the, well, here the most common side is the junction of anterior communicating artery and ACA. So if we have this uh, circle of this over here, okay, we have the anterior communicating and we have the anterior communicating, okay? The most common is at the junction of anterior communicating and ACA. So over, so it's uh, almost as if the aneurysm is over here. Okay, so this is the area of the aneurysm. This is where the aneurysm will happen. Uh, most common is the junction of the AD and it is also associated with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So these are two important conditions of adult polycystic uh, of, of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. In autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, I'm pretty sure you guys have uh, heard about this before. If you guys have not, we will talk about this in detail so when we study nephrology. That in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, you also get uh, hepatic. Um, okay, so what are the things that you, uh, what are the 
syndromes of, I mean, what are the other problems with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? Does anyone have any idea? Hypertension and? Okay, let's put this. So hypertension, hematuria, hepatic, pancreatic cyst. That, that's what I wanted to know. So you, you, wanna, you have cysts in the liver, you have cysts in the pancreas, and then you have cystic dilatation of the uh, you have cystic dilatation of the um, blood vessels, and then you have cysts in the kidney by polycystic kidney disease. So it's a very cystic disease. So autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And then you also have ALL Danlos syndrome. We'll talk about this in detail. This is a connective tissue disorder. Okay, we'll talk about this in biochemistry. Okay, next one is, uh, there are some other factors of aneurysm, which are advanced age. So uh, senile degeneration of the blood vessels, hypertension, smoking, okay. That's what it is. Okay, so the, this rupture of this aneurysm is, uh, if you guys remember, we talked about this in subacrine hemorrhage, that if, that if these aneurysms rupture, you get subacrine hemorrhage. That is the worst headache of their life, worst headache of our life, okay? And they, these are also known as thunderclap headaches, okay? These are extremely, extremely painful as if there is thunderstorm going in your head, okay? So these are known as thunderclap headaches. The patient literally has to lie down in the bed and this will affect their work, their life, okay? And along with this, the patient would also get focal neurological deficits, okay? And, um, okay, so another thing is uh, the anterior communicating artery over here, if there's an aneurysm, we know that the optic chiasm is closed to over here. So if there is, an, if, uh, there is a dilatation of an anterior communicating artery, this will put pressure on the optic chiasm. And we know what happens when you have pressures of the optic chiasm, you will get bitemporal hemianopia. You will get bitemporal hemianopia over here like this, okay? Bitemporal hemianopia. And um, <clears throat> the, patient, the patients will also get ischemia of the anterior cerebral artery. And uh, ischemia of the anterior cerebral artery can result in can contralateral hemiparesis of the lower extremities. Contralateral hemiparesis of the lower extremities. That's what it is, okay? Are we clear about anterior communicating artery damages? Next one, okay, good. Next one is an MCA aneurysm. Okay, if, if you have an MCA aneurysm, what would happen basically? If you have an MCA aneurysm, there'll be rupture of the MCA. And we talked about this. What are the things to look out for in an MCA damage? What are the signs and symptoms of the patient of an MCA damage, please? Paralysis in which, which part, upper arm, lower arm, where? Face and upper limb, very good. Face and upper limb, okay? So there will be damage of the face and upper limb, okay? Now, if you have a damage of the posterior communicating artery, okay, so this is this is the uh, vertebral artery forming the posterior communicating, forming the posterior cerebral artery. Then we have the um, this one over here, internal carotids, okay? And then we have these arteries over here. These are the posterior communicating artery. If there is a posterior communicating artery compression, this will result in a third cranial nerve palsy or uh, ptosis. Okay, so there will be uh, blown pupil and ptosis, and this is this is what happens in the third cranial nerve palsy because, because the third cranial nerve, because the third cranial nerve is somewhere over here. Okay, and if there's dilatation of uh, if there's dilatation of uh, these posterior communicating arteries like this, this will put pressure on the nerves. This will put pressure on the nerve and this can cause your uh, dilatation and uh, blown out pupil. And this is known as uh, third cranial nerve palsy. Okay, this is known as third cranial, third cranial nerve palsy. Okay. And how important is a posterior communicating artery aneurysm? And my answer is, if you have to receive one question from aneurysm, if you have to receive one question from aneurysm, it, it, this is, it's the one regarding posterior communicating artery aneurysmal dilatation and its association with third cranial nerve. So take this very, very, very seriously. Okay, next one. Next one is charcot bouchard micro aneurysm. charcot bouchard micro aneurysm. And we talked about this before. We're gonna talk about this once again last time is that this is associated with long-term hypertension. This affects the small vessels that, that is lenticulostriate arteries, which are the vessels of the MCA. And this can cause hemorrhagic intraparenchymal strokes. Hemorrhagic intraparenchymal strokes. And also what type of hemorrhage are they going to cause? Fast answers, please. What type of hemorrhages are they going to cause? 
we have epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intrapancal hemorrhage. Okay, intrapancal hemorrhage. Once again, can I get some answers? Epidural hematoma, which one of the arteries are damaged? For epidural hematoma, fast answer, please. MMA, which one of the arteries are damaged for subdural hematoma? It's not an artery, it's a vein, it's a bridging vein. Okay, the bridging veins. Which, uh, okay, subarachnoid hemorrhage, what is the most common cause of a, the subarachnoid hemorrhage? Berry aneurysm, rupture of berry aneurysm. And what is the most common artery that is damaged for intraparenchymal hemorrhage? Intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Lenticulo striate, I mean, lenticulo striate arteries. Okay. Okay. Okay, all right. So we are done with this page. Okay. Now, what we are going to do is we are going to start a very important topic that is seizures. Are, are you guys, um, okay, have you guys understood the lecture till now? Have you guys understood the lecture till now? Okay. Um, do you guys want to take? Oh, you guys want? Okay, so do you guys want to stop here or do you guys want to take a break here? Which one? Okay. <clears throat> okay, once again, we have the competition of breakers and stoppers. Okay, so what we are going to do is we are going to do a vote. Okay we are going to do a vote. Okay, so let's see if we have everyone here. Uh, why are we missing some students? Are we missing some students over here? Okay. Okay. So I guess most of the students have their um, medical schools which have reopened um, due to the control of the coronavirus. So most of them are absent, okay. Is anyone here going to medical school or uh, medical college in the country? Okay. 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 So, so most of them have their colleges at this point, I guess. Okay. Okay. So do we have any doctors over here? Do we have any doctors over here who uh, who is doing this class in morning time? Okay, Dr. Hassan, which, which college did you go to? Dr. Hassan, you came, uh, you did the same, uh, you did your college and your, you did your medical school from the same country which I did. Which college did you go to? AFMC, okay, so is, is that for Armed Force Medical College? Um, for medical college. Okay, that is very good to know. Okay, that is a brilliant, brilliant medical college. Okay, that's good. Okay, so do we have any other uh, physicians over here who are doing the classes in, um, who are doing their classes in morning time? Anyone? I'm sorry, I think I asked this question before and I got some answers. Um, do we have any physicians over here who is doing the classes in morning time once again? Morning time. Okay. Okay, so we have one physician, two physicians, three physicians, 6 a.m. Okay, so that is very early. Okay. Oh, so if you guys are doing the classes at 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., so that, that is very good. Okay, so you guys are done with the biggest part of your study session that is studying first aid early in the morning. The rest of the time can be dedicated to your preparation by solving new world questions. Okay, and uh, for all the other physicians who are doing these classes in the evening and at night, you guys are bound to complete the new world questions before our lecture and then start the lecture afterwards. Okay. Okay, so we will start with our voting for stopping and breaking. So for stop, we will write S. For, for breaks, we will write B. Okay, so let's start with a vote for stop. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, which is 10. Okay, so far 10 people said stop. 
four people said break. 11, 12. Okay. 13, 14. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. The reason why I try to do this is just to give you guys a little bit of fun. Okay. So what we are going to do is, um, okay, I really want to continue because uh, I feel like a new neurology is uh, quite a big topic. I feel like we should we should continue uh, at least for at least um, two to three more pages. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so instead of taking, uh, instead of stopping over here and taking a break, can we take a break for around five to 10 minutes so that you guys can get uh, some freshness or refreshed for at least, um, okay? So that way, this will allow, since this is the last day of the week, okay, Friday is the last day of the week, and I wanted to make a little bit of a dent in the lectures by completing it, okay? So it's in the, since this is the last day of the week, you, you guys will get two days of free uh, of uh, weekends anyways. So why not move a little bit extra, okay? So um, that, that's what we're going to do. So it's 12.30 as of right now. Instead of finishing the lectures at, let's say, 1, 1.30, the difference is we would be finishing the lecture, let's say, around um, 1.45 or 2, okay? So just 15 more minutes or 20 more minutes. That's what we will do. It's 12.31. It's, it's 12.30, okay? Okay, that's what it is. So let's take the break till 12.45. Okay, but then there's another thing. Um, don't, don't make me push you guys to learn more than you guys can swallow, okay? If you feel like seizure, because seizure is extremely important, uh, headaches are extremely important. If, if you think this will be hard for you to learn, because if you think you feel exhausted because you guys will have to do questions and you will know too, then I'm more than happy to stop. Tomorrow is a Saturday, so so Saturday is a uh, Saturday is our fun time. Okay. Okay. So Monday, yeah, right? Okay. I know you mean. I know you meant Monday. Right. Good. Okay. So weekend. <clears throat> okay. So on weekends, I do not expect anyone to study. Okay, because I want you guys to take your time off very seriously, as I want you guys to take your time on as seriously too okay so please stop okay so we have okay so i will stop okay for me better to stop. okay so i will stop okay so uh, let's stop the first aid lectures no problem okay we'll stop the first aid lectures not everyone is happy okay okay you are welcome okay no problem. So we will stop and what we will do is instead of taking the 10 minute break, we will take the five minute break. Okay. And then we will start with our URL notes. Okay. We will start with our URL notes. Okay.
Okay, so is everyone back from their break? Um, whoever is back, please feel free to unmute yourself and let me know. Okay, so do we have uh, the students back from the break? Yes. Okay, let me see who's back. Okay, good. So we have the students who are back from their break. Okay, good. So what I'm going to do is as usual every day, uh, I'd ask you guys to uh, unmute yourselves during your UL prep. Okay, during your UL notes, and that's exactly what you guys can do today too. So this will save me some time to go back to the chat box and see who's writing what. Okay, so please feel free to the feel free to unmute yourself and answer the questions. Okay, <clears throat> so first question is: okay. uterine artery, which 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 artery gives rise to uterine artery? Internal uh, internal iliac artery. Internal iliac artery. Internal iliac. Iliac artery, and where does internal iliac artery come from? From uh, common iliac artery. Very good. Okay. 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 So these are just some small informations here and there. Okay. Uh, at times, the students have a hard time figuring this out. If it's internal iliac or external iliac, the answer is external. Uh, the answer is internal iliac. Okay. Okay, good. Next one. Next one is if you have a patient who has fever followed by rash after three days and it's a young neonatal patient. What is your diagnosis? It is uh, Rosella. Rosella, yeah. Very good. Rosella infanto. infanto. Okay, what is the or, or, well, what is the microorganism responsible for rosy? Human herpes six and seven. Okay, Dr. Adenon, thank you. Okay. Six or seven? Six and six, seven. Six. Was... Very good. What is seven? Kaposi sarcoma. I heard someone say that. Eight is Kaposi sarcoma. Eight is what is seven once again? It is mentioned uh, in Rosella, both of them, human herpes six and seven. Okay, but HSV six is more specific. Okay, so always yeah. remember, okay, six is more specific. Next one, if you have a patient with personality changes, okay, what is the damage of the brain? Where is, where do you think the damage is for uh, personality frontal. changes? Frontal. Frontal. Frontal, frontal. frontal cortex. Damage due to disinhibition. Damage due to damage due damage to I'm sorry. Damage to orbital frontal cortex. Okay, next one. Okay, if you have a young patient, young patient with chronic diarrhea, failure to thrive. 
respiratory infections. I'm pretty sure you guys know where I'm going with this. With pseudomonas infiltrations. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis. Very good. Cystic fibrosis. What is the? Uh, how do we diagnose cystic fibrosis? Salt test. Salt. Uh, sweat. Sweat, sweat chloritis. Is that confirmatory? Yes or no? Is that confirmatory? Can we confirm cystic fibrosis by sweat chloride test, or can we suspect? Genetic analysis. Is genetic is the consensus. The genetic analysis and how and what will we analyze in the genes of the patient? CFTR gene mutation. Very good. Very good. CFTR. CFTR. Test is known. Five hundred eight. Very good. So the test is known as basically the test is known as a CFTR test. Okay. So cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein test. Okay. Good. Next one. Next one is. Okay. Hepatitis D, hepatitis D, okay. Can you guys tell me what type of, uh, okay, so I'm going to write this for you. There's a replication defect. The, the uh, hepatitis D virus cannot replicate by themselves. Okay, hepatitis D cannot replication by themselves, cannot replicate by themselves. So there is a rep replication defect. And the problem is, okay, how can they, uh, how can they, um, how can they fix this defect? Do you guys have any idea what is needed in order for the replication? Using the DNA polymerase of the hepatitis B. Hepatitis B surface antigen. Okay, okay. So thank you, and so they can, they can perform replication by coding with HBSAG. Okay, they must, they, they can perform replication by coding with HBSAG. Okay, surface antigen. Okay. Okay, what are the two serum findings of osteoblastic activity? Alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline ALP. Okay, every one of us know ALP is important for osteoblastic activity. Yeah. I have mentioned another thing in the past. Citrate, maybe? No. Oh. I doubt I have mentioned this in the past. Uh, okay, so this is from AMBOSS. Okay, so number one is, number one, first and foremost, is increased in ALP. And this is enough for... Uh, for a very good student to answer, okay. But if you want to be extra than the than a very good student, okay. There's another there's another thing which you can understand and which you can which you can test. That is, okay. So this is not needed in order for you to um, answer your questions in U world, okay. But we know emboss is a whole different ball game, okay. We know that uh, solving emboss is a whole different ball game. So emboss for emboss, we you also need increase PINP. Okay. So what is PINP? PINP is N terminal pro peptide of type one collagen. Okay. Oh my god. Yes. Oh my god. That is that is true. Okay. So that's what it is. The N terminal pro peptide of type one collagen. Okay. So PINP. So if you have a question in Ambos, and we do not know how questions in uh, the actual exams are coming nowadays, the questions are becoming a bit difficult. Okay. Because the competition is rising each and every year. So if you have questions where you have uh, mention of PINP, I do not want any one of our students to get scared when they view something like PINP, because right now you know what PINP is. PINP is basically the terminal end of your, basically, if you have a type one collagen, you know how the type one collagen has two ends, N, N, N and S. So the N terminal of the propeptide type one collagen, we will discuss this in details in biochemistry. Um, so the N terminal of the propeptide type one collagen is extremely increased in osteoblastic activity. And this is an indicator of osteoblastic activity. So if you want to confirm this, you can do a PINP test. 
Okay, so did everyone understand PINP? It's not as hard as it seems. Yes. And middle end of yes. propane fat type one common. Okay. What is the most common? What is the most common side effect of SSRI? Number one side effect of SSRI. Uh, hyperphagia. Mm. Increase on anxiety. Increase to the beginning. Uh, no, not for the purpose of In you. Insomnia. Okay, so these are all right answers. So don't get me wrong. Yeah, symptoms. Uh, repair dysfunction. There you go. Erectile dysfunctions. Four. The, this is the number one, the first uh, symptom that a patient will, uh, the patient will experience if they are on SSRI. Okay, according to UO. Okay, if you have a patient with history of celiac disease. Okay. History of celiac, of celiac disease. Now the patient has anaphylaxis after blood transfusion. Okay, this is a very high yield question and a very difficult question, but this will become extremely easy when we discuss about immunodeficiency disorder. Anaphylaxis after blood transfusion. By the way, I have already made videos about immunodeficiency disorders in my channel. I have a channel on YouTube. Uh, we also have a video about this in our page. So you guys can go and check it out if you want to, or you guys can wait till we cover immunology again. Okay, so what is the condition? IgA deficiency. IgA deficiency. Selective IgA deficiency. How do you, how do you uh, prevent this anaphylaxis in a patient with history of, cel of celiac disease? Transfuse from a IgA donor, IgA deficiency. I'm sorry, I did not answer. I did not get your answer. What was the answer? Transfuse from IgA donors, IgA deficient, deficient donors. Okay, so that is one way. Okay, okay, so you can transfuse from an IgA deficient donor. Okay. All right, there is another way which I will talk about later. I do not want to put more pressure right now. Okay, but I will talk about that another technique later when we discuss selective IgA deficiency. Okay. Next question is a very easy question, and I have talked. Uh, we have I have discussed about this in uh, gastrointestinal system. Uh, <laughs> if you have a rupture of posterior posterior duodenal bulb, which artery is uh, gastroduodenal? Gastroduodenal. <laughs> okay, gastroduodenal artery. Next one. Okay. What is the name of this very famous bacteria, which is gram negative, oxidase positive, and non lactose fermenting? Pseudomonas. 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 Okay. 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 So, once again, what are the an antibiotics needed to treat pseudomonas? So anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. Uh, G-benicillin. Okay, so we're going to go step by step. Number one, what are the penicillin group of antibiotics that can be used to treat um, pseudomonas? Ticarcillin, oh, Okay, we have ticarcillin and piperacillin. Piperacillin. Okay. Okay, next one. The next one is aminoglycosides. Uh, let's talk a little bit about cephalosporin. Ceftazidine. Okay, we have third and fourth gen. Third and fourth, yeah. Okay, and third is, okay, so Dr. Adenon said the right answer. That is third is one. Ceftazidine. <laughs> and fourth is. Fourth is anyone? There's only one for fourth. There's only one antibiotic for fourth generation. Next one are our fluoroquinolones. Right, fluoroquinolones. Aminoglycosides. Uh, for fluoroquinolones, what are the antibiotics which are which can be used for pseudomonas? Anyone? Also third generation and fourth, like fibrofloxacin. 
Ciprofloxacin. And lipofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin. maybe also. Next one. Next one is amino glycosides. Amicacin. Gentamicin or tobramycin. Tobramycin and gentamicin. Next one. Monobactams. Imibinim. Uh, imibinim is not a monobactam. It's a. 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 It's Okay, so what is the reason for discussing so many um, antibiotics? The reason for discussing so many antibiotics are because you will receive questions and when you will have uh, one of the names of these ones in your answer stems. And uh, you world, although treatment protocols are important for step two, step one has some treatment where, uh, some questions where they require treatments. And pseudomonal treatment is, extremely high yield okay so i'm just going to write just in case over here extremely high yield okay because pseudomonas is a very uh, uh so pseudomonal infections are taken extremely seriously over here and uh, the antibiotics are uh, are as such very serious so it's important that you guys remember all the names of the antibiotics according to the groups okay next next question one second if you have an antibodies one second please Uh, is it okay if I ask um, one of you guys to decrease the volume of the surrounding electronic structure so that I can help, so that I can focus a bit more? Again, sir, I didn't get. Okay, thank you. Okay, so okay, the next one, fever. If you have a patient with fever, rash, and posterior, posterior, auricular. I think Robella. I very good. Oh, yeah. we, we, we did this before. Yeah, we did this before. Yeah. We did it. Yeah. And I guess Dr. Adenam was the one who said rubella. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And, posterior and I'm just going to write it again, just in case. Okay. What Doctor, which one, which one uh, among missiles and rubella, the rash spread uh, fastly, like more uh, fast to the, to the body? In between the... rubella and which one? Rubella and missile. Rubella and measles, which one spreads faster? Okay, so uh, measles are more fast. Yeah, measles. Ah. Okay. Because okay. according to the days, okay, measles occur faster than rubella. Okay, okay. next one. Rubella, what type, wh which group of uh, family, which group of uh, viral family does rubella belong to? Uh, Flavi. Nope. Toga virus. Oh. Toga. Yeah. Uh, Toga. Okay. Next one. Okay, so I want to discuss about uh, some of the risk factors for uh, HPV. Okay, some of the risk factors for HPV. So risk factors for HPV, v, um, cervical carcinoma. I know a lot of you know this already, but according to the severity, you world has it name, head you world, you world has it. Uh, mentioned uh, according nu numerically according to the severity. So, what is the number one risk factor? Multiple partners. Uh, okay. So uh, Sex in early age. Very good. Early age at first sexual sexual encounter. Next one. Multiple partner. Multiple 
mug or I'm going to write monogamy. Okay. It's the same thing. Monogamy. Mm -hmm. okay, next one. OCP. Excuse me, is monogamy is one uh, partner or multiple? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, polygamy. Polygamy. I apologize. Sorry. Uh, po uh, polygamy. Okay. What, what is the next one? Unprotected immunosuppression. Okay. Next one. OCP. Next one. Tobacco. Next one. Low socio economic condition. Okay. Next one. Okay. Can you guys name the viruses where genetic reassortment is possible? Segmented virus. Okay, what are the names of the, the segmented viruses? Rio uh, viruses. Rio okay. viruses and um, influenza, maybe. Influenza. influenza. Then? then? Hmm? The virus. This is virus. Or or virus. Rotavirus. virus. Okay. Next one. Rina. Rina viruses. Rio virus. Next. Rina viruses. Arena virus. Next. Last one. Uh, but, uh, what? Ponia. Ponia. Yeah. Ponia. Yes, Ponia virus. Very okay. Next one. Okay, so this is this one is for NBME. Okay, NBME. Okay, so RAS activation. One second, please. RAS activation. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. Okay, I will come. I will explain this later because this will be too difficult for you to grasp right now. I will skip this. I will move on to the next one. What is the name of the organism? This is a very easy question. What is the name of the organism which produces dextra and cause infective endocarditis? Viridens. Viridens. Viridens strep. And the question is, this is not the question. The question is, they tell you about um, an organism which produces dextra and causes the card is and uh, in your mind you know you you are talking, you're talking about virus type of right? but the question is where in the tissue of the valve does the um, organism bind to what does the organism bind to in order to collagen collagen is not the right answer but the collagen fibrin fibrin damage the valve in fibrin good so they bind to fib fibrin and platelets. Okay, so uh, they also have collagen over there as an answer option. Okay, and uh, this is one of those uh, questions where you think the answer is very easy. So a lot of students have answered collagen, and surprisingly, the uh, answer percentage for collagen was fifty-five percent, and the answer percentage for fibrins were thirty-five to thirty-two percent. Okay, so be careful for these questions. These questions are. They look like they're easy, but they have a certain problems to them, so be careful. Okay. Okay, can you tell me what type of pa uh, okay, patients with panic disorders? Patients with panic disorders, what type of phobias can they develop? This is an MBOS question. This question is- Social. What type of phobia can they develop? Social. Social phobia. Okay, so what is the name of social phobia? Agoraphobia. 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 There you go. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Okay. One second, please. Okay. So if you have a patient with neural tube defect. What what are the changes uh, you can see in a patient? Uh, I mean, in the in amniocentesis, if if the if the baby has neural tube defect, if you do an amniocentesis, increase alpha fetal protein. 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 Increase alpha fetal protein.
Acetylcholine or acetylcholine esterase? Acetylcholine okay. okay, next one. Okay. Okay, what type of conduction does a beta blocker stop or decrease? What type of conduction? Ah. Uh. Beta blocker slows down what conduction? A C nodal, A V nodal. A V, A V nodal. A V. A V nodal. A V. As a result, which what is the change in the E C G? I talked about this in the C V S pharmacology. P R enlargement, elongation of P R. Prolonged P R. Okay, increased P R interval. Okay, next one. Next one is. Okay. Okay. One second. Okay. okay. So this is what I'm going to do. Okay. Effects of maneuvers in a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a very high yield question for your U world, for your emboss, for your um, actual exam. Okay. So the maneuvers are, okay, once again, may, then, once again, okay, preload, okay, then we have, then we have, murmur sound, murmurs, then we have left ventricular blood volume. Now, the first name is Valsalva. What is the preload changes in uh, decrease the preload? Decrease the preload. Decrease. Decrease. Yeah, decrease. Decrease. Decrease preload. Why will the de why will the preload decrease? Because the decrease left left ventric because the <laughs> intrathoracic pressure and intra-abdominal pressure is increased, therefore the return, venous return will be decreased. Yeah, decreased left ventricle. Okay, preload. Oh, okay, I'm going to keep this. Okay, I'm going to keep this for later. I will explain. Okay, what happens to the murmur? Increase. 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 What happens to the left ventricle blood volume? Decrease. 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 Yeah. Next one is abrupt standing. What will happen to preload? Decrease. 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 Ah. As a matter of fact, yes. even huh? decrease. Okay, good. One second. Let me move to the back. Okay. Okay. Next one. What will happen to the what will happen to the murmur? Increase. Okay. Okay. And what will happen to the left ventricular blood volume? Decrease. Decrease, yeah. Next one. Next one. Nitroglycerin infusion. Same. Decrease. Increase. Decrease. decrease. Next. Next is, okay, next is, okay, one second, please. Sustained hand grip. Yeah, it's opposite. It will be opposite. Yeah, increase the preload. Increased, and then left ventricle. Decrease. Left ventricle blood volume. Increase. Increase. Increase left volume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, may I okay, next one, squatting. Same. Increase the preload. Same. Same. Increase the same. Same. Yeah, increase. Leg raise. As if leg raise. Increase, the increase, increase the preload, increase and more, decrease and more, increase, 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 
Decree? Huh? Mama is increased. Oh, mama yeah. is Murmur decreased. Murmur decreased. Murmur decreased. You're right. Yeah. One second. You're right. Okay, one second. Murmur, decreased. The murmur in passive leg raise will be decreased. It will not yeah. decrease. Okay. Okay. Even I got confused. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. So these are questions which even confuses me to this very day. Okay. So thank God I'm not a cardiologist. So um, if anyone wants to be, a, if anyone wants to be a cardiologist, it's on you. It's not on me. Okay. Although it is on me because I'm teaching. Can we ask you what you what is your speciality, doctor? I have not started my residency as of yet. I will start my. Uh, residency. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay. okay, so um, next one is uh, if you have a patient with, okay, if I started my residency, I wouldn't have the time to teach you guys. So that, that's, that's one thing. Yeah. I will not be teaching you guys after uh, uh, two to three months. Okay. I will go on my work. Okay, so what is, uh, no, what is fine hypertension syndrome? Okay. So if you have a patient, okay, if it's a gravid patient and the patient is lying in a certain way, so let's say the patient is lying on the right side, okay. Okay, you have a condition on a supine hypertension syndrome. Does anyone know what this is? Anyone? Okay, so if you have a patient more than, more than, 20 weeks of gravity. Probably secondary to compression of inferior vena cava. Very good. More than 20 weeks of gravity uterus. Compression is due to ah. inferior yeah. vena cava. <clears throat> when she lies, especially on, on the right side. Very good. Yes. So the patient, so make sure when you have a patient who, who has a gravid uterus of more than 20 weeks, don't let them, um, don't let them lie on their right side okay so this can it is right side or right side back or back in the back right side right, side. right. right. in nothing in new world okay so yeah. have you guys received this question in new world yeah no and bme also i received okay yes. so, so this goes for both bme and new world okay so be careful uh, and questions are what, I think will happen, what will happen if they lie on the back you have one in the line in the back, and which one do you have in your? No, I, my question is, uh, what will happen if they lie on their back? If they lie on their back, then that is not a problem. Uh, okay. I think right. we saw uh, we saw a question on your word uh, says uh, on the back. I'm if, not really it, sure. But it, if this is the because uh, back, maybe. the inferior vena cava is on the right side of the patient. Okay, so, okay, so let me break it down for you. Right? Okay, so first of all, thank you all for your uh, uh, for your feedbacks. So let me break it down for you. First of all, let's say that you have the you have the gravid uterus over here, and then that, let's say this is the right side. So this is the gravid uterus. So this is the right side. Okay. So let's say you will have some questions where they will tell you that the patient is lying on their back, and then the patient has hypotension. And if it's a gravid uterus. Uh, the important thing that you have to take into into, consider, into consideration is it does not matter what the position of the patient is. The, the, the only thing that you have to focus on is the compression. Okay, so the compression could e could either be if the patient is on the left side. Okay, very rarely, but it, it could happen. So the main thing that you have to focus on if the patient is if the patient is more than twenty weeks gravid, and if the patient has hypotension when the patient lies supine or on the right side, then there is compression of the vessel. And the question is, what is the name of the syndrome? The name of the syndrome is supine hypertension syndrome. So you will get questions in new world. So basically what happened was I, I, I personally, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, what, we, what we did was uh, what, when we solved U world and when we solved AMBOSS, we got this question where they said that the patient was on the right side. And the thing is, in certain NBME questions, you will get when the we will get the same condition where they will tell you that the patient is lying on their back. Okay. So having said that, um, the only thing that you should focus on is the compression of the inferior vena cava. Are we clear? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. Perfect. Next one. Next one is if you have a patient with cystic lesion in cystic lesions in HIV, 
okay when the hiv uh, uh when the uh, t-cell count is less than 200 and the patient has cystic lesions mainly in the brain what do you think the name of the organism is what is the name of the condition toxoplasma gonda toxoplasma uh or uh, or G okay. So the most common one is T Gondi. Okay. That's what it is. Okay. This is the first thing that you have to think about when you when you think when you uh, read uh, cystic lesions in the brain after the patient has HIV. So T Gondi is the one in concern. Okay, good one. Next one. Next one is um, doing exercise. Doing exercise if you have a patient. Um, okay, during exercise, what happens to the, what happens to the, um, one second, please. What, what, what happens to the vascular resistance? Does it increase? Decrease. 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 Okay, why? Why is the answer, because, the answer is why? Because adrenaline work more on beta receptors. Okay. Because no, because adrenaline oh, in low and low in low amount works uh, more in, on beta receptors, beta two. But if it will be in high amount, such uh, um, adrenaline infusion, it will it will work more on alpha receptor. Okay, so that so that is one. Okay, so that is one explanation. But the thing is, the problem with this question was there was no adrenaline in the ant system. What else can cause um, decreased uh, decreased vascular resistance? Coronary vasodilation. Why? Muscular, doctor, also muscular, vaso, muscular vessels, muscular I vascular dilation due to potassium. Secondary to nitric oxide. There we go. From the due okay, to low. potassium and nitric oxide. Okay, local release of metabolites. Okay, so there are some local release of the metabolites. Okay, I know this is uh, very silly. Every one of you have answered the right way. But, but U world has its ways of looking for its own answers. And for some reason, they were looking for this answer. So local release of metabolism. So keep this in mind. Okay, next one. Next one is, next one is in A gamma globulinemia. Globulinemia. You have in A gamma globulinemia. Okay. To answer your previous question, uh, uh, I, I used to be an ER physician in another country and over here I haven't started my residency. Okay, so that, so uh, in the beginning of our lectures when I, when I had a student ask me um, what is your specialty and uh, I answered I'm an ER physician is because I used to be an ER physician and um, right now uh, just waiting for my residency for next year so that's that. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so let's move back to our discussion. Okay, so, you, so in a patient with A-gamma globulinemia, okay, what are the changes you expect to see when you uh, do a lymph node biopsy? Uh, atrophy of lymph nodes. Okay, what do you see in the biopsy of the lymph node? The structural changes in the lymph node? No, but what's, which structure will be absent in the lymph node? Uh, uh, lymph follicles. Follicular. Absent? Cortex, absent cortex or follicles? Follicles. Follicles. Center. Laminal centers will be absent, yes or no? Yeah. Will be absent, yeah. Will be absent. Will be absent. Will center be absent. Because okay. they are uh, going to answer this for you, no problem. Okay, thank you so much for answering. Absence, absent germinal centers, absent germinal centers because of absence of uh, isotype switching. Okay, isotype switching occurs in uh, isotype switching occurs in a uh, isotype switching. Is, a, uh, is absent in a gamma globulinemia, and as a result, the germinal center is also absent. Okay, next one. Crescendo, decrescendo. Crescendo, decrescendo murmur is heard. Aortic stenosis. Aortic stenosis. One second. Okay, so this is what happens when you guys don't hear the whole question. Okay, so crescendo, decrescendo murmur is heard within in a patient 
leaning forward. Now answer. What is the answer? Leaning forward. Okay, this is a high yield emboss question. Okay, and to this very day, I have difficulty answering these type of questions. Uh, crescendo, decrescendo. It's hurting the patient leaning forward. Okay, so I real I remember this because I received this question in my actual exam a long time back. Okay. Doctor in the carotid area. Yes. Diastolic murmur or diastolic? Crescendo, decrescendo. Okay, okay, so for some reason, okay. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's aortic regurgitation. If the patient leans forward and you hear a murmur which is increasing and decreasing, okay, crescendo and decrescendo, and the question is not specified, has not specified whether the murmur is a systolic murmur or the murmur is a diastolic murmur, but the, patient, but the question has specified that the patient is leaning forward. Okay, with a patient leaning forward, crescendo, decrescendo, murmur, uh, the murmur of aortic regurgitation is uh, more uh, specific. Okay, so try to keep this in mind. Hopefully, you guys will not receive such difficult and unnecessary questions. But if, if you guys do, hope the notes which we are making right now help you guys. Okay, okay, what is the biochemical biochemical problem with hepatic? with hepatic steatosis. Uh, absence of the lack of synthesis of uh, VLDL. Perfect, okay, so decreased. VLDL. FFA oxidation, it's the same thing. So decreased free fatty acid oxidation. Mm -hmm. free, fatty, free fatty acid oxidation decreases. Okay, next one, next one is uh, one second. Okay, what do you call this condition in which, okay, there's a change in viral, viral coding, viral coat surface receptor. I'm pretty sure a lot of you will answer this very perfectly right now. Okay. Change in viral coat surface receptor without change in viral genome. Ah. What? I am very confident you guys will answer this. There is shift and the drift and I'm keeping confusing. Okay, so maybe so it's shift. Okay, so uh, it's, it's yeah. shift, not drift. Shift, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's uh, the, the problem was the answer stem did not contain in antigenic shift, nor did ah. it contain antigenic drift. Do you have anything else in mind? Transduction or? Have you guys heard of phenotype mixing? Uh, yeah, phenotype mixing. Yeah. Oh, okay. I knew you guys would know this. Sometimes you guys like to hide your knowledge. Okay. No problem. So, so very good job. Okay, so the answer is phenotype mixing. Okay. This is also a very difficult question and um, okay. So the problem is there are a lot of questions which you will get in new world where you would think that you know the answer, but the problem is when you look for that option in the answer stand, that answer will not be there. For example, how Dr. Hossam thought that antigenic shift and antigenic drift should be the answer, but the answer was not available in the answer stand. So that's that. Can you give me one second, please? Okay, next one. Okay, next one is... Um, Okay, good question. Next one is during percutaneous coronary. Okay, during percutaneous coronary intervention, access to femoral. Okay, so this should have been another question. My question was during percutaneous intervention, which artery do we take the access from? The answer is access to femoral artery. Okay, but there is, there is another question in you world okay so for example if we have rupture of the posterior wall of femoral artery where will the blood collection take place retro uh, retro retro peritoneal you guys received this question already yes it's present 
And so uh, thank you so much for doing your questions perfectly. And as you can see, uh, you're reaping the benefits because uh, you can answer the questions very easily and with confidence. Okay, so that is very good. Okay, next one. Okay. Can you guys tell me the anatomical landmark? This is a high yield question too of great saphenous vein. For the purpose of solving questions in AMBOSS. The media Found it. Simran Triangle. And okay. 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 Uh, with that being said. Um, uh, it's one of the femoral triangle and interlateral aspect of pubic tubercle. With that being said, um, it is not important for you guys to solve emboss. Okay, please, I don't want to put you guys in extra pressure by um, asking you guys to solve emboss because emboss has a lot more questions. And I personally feel that if you can master U world, emboss is not necessary. Okay, uh, we did emboss because we wanted to do emboss because. Um, just for the sake of doing questions, that's what it is. That, that's that's what it was. Okay. So uh, for purpose of you doing good in your exam, we're doing U world more than once is enough. Okay. And you will get the extra notes from Amboss. Anyway, we would be discussing Amboss questions in this type of discussion, anyways. So most of the high yield Amboss questions will be provided for you by us. So do not worry about solving Amboss. Okay. Okay. One second. Okay. Okay. If you have a patient with diffuse muscle rigidity after inhaled anesthetics. Yeah, halocene. What is the name of this condition? Uh, malignant hypothermia. Very good. Okay. Now the question was, what is the pathology behind malignant hypothermia? Rianodine gene deficiency. Which one? Rianodine gene deficiency. Okay. Due to abnormal RYR. Rianodine receptor in sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. As a result, what happens? Does the calcium intake increases or decreases? Decreases. Okay. I mean the calcium release. Calcium Increase. Increases. Increases. Okay. Okay. How do you treat a patient with these conditions? Antholine. Yes. Okay. So this is a very high yield. Okay. This is a very, very high yield. Um, uh, topic right, which I just discussed about. This will help you guys solve at least a lot of questions because the questions will come, uh, for example, questions will come about the diagnosis, questions will come about increased calcium release, questions will come about dantrolene, questions will, will come about rhinodines. Okay, so be careful for these questions. They will come again and again next because your world has the likings of certain questions and they will want to uh, test it by uh, seeing whether you guys have understood that they ask these questions over and over again. This one. What is the name of the fungus um, incubated? Let me see how many students do we have, or did they ever leave? Okay, we have five. We have we have five students who already left. Okay, no problem. Okay, okay. okay so fungus incubated at thirty-seven degree Celsius for two hours. What is the name of this fungus? Which fungus can be incubated at 37 degrees Celsius? Candida. Candida. Okay. 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 Okay, last one. And then after that, we will end. Last one, okay? 
So we discussed about this before. Holo, prosen, cephaly. Holo, prosen, cephaly. What is the problem with a patient with holo, prosen, cephaly? Sonic hedgehog gene. Okay, so uh, that is the main problem. Thank you for answering. But it's an inability. What is the structural problem? Midland. Ability to divide. to divide into two hemispheres. Divide into two hemispheres. Here. As a result, what are the uh, presentations of the patient? Cyclopia. Cyclopia and? Left, 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 that is completely okay. Okay, so if we have birthdays, okay. no. whoever is having a birthday, happy birthday. Okay, next one is what is another uh, feature of the patient with a uh, hollow prosencephaly? One ventricle. Mono mono ventricle. Fuse base and ganglia. Fusion of basal ganglia. Developmental field defect. That's the problem. This is the main problem. This is a, this is a field defect. Okay. If anyone asks you what is the main problem with the patients with holoposencephaly, first of all, your answer should be it's a field defect. What, what, what is the field defect? It's a midline field defect. What, with gene is associated? The sonic hedgehog gene. What is the problem? The problem is the inability of the forebrain to divide into hemispheres. What are the presentations? The presentations are cyclopia, cleft lip, cleft palate, mental retardations, monoventricles, and fusion of basal ganglia. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, with that being said, we are done with the UL notes for today, or do you guys want to continue? Enough, enough for today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, enough. Enough for today. Okay. <laughs> So thank you so much for you guys to continue, uh, I mean, for participating, okay? And, uh, okay, so sh should we do some questions or stop? I'm just gonna mute you guys because we're done with the discussion, okay? If you guys want to talk, please use the chat box, okay? So um, uh, do we talk about your question or no? Okay, exhausted. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, anyone else? Okay, let's do some UL. Okay, so let's do some UL questions. Okay, so um, it, it won't take that long. Okay, it will not take that long. And the thing is, while I prepare the questions, and as per the suggestions provided by us, by Dr. Karbazi, uh, he gave us a brilliant um, idea about solving UL question one day and solving Kaplan questions another day. So what we are going to do is, today we are going to solve uh, UWorld questions and um, tomorrow we're going, or on Monday we will do Kaplan's. So give me some time, give me, give me around five minutes, okay? And in that five minutes, you guys can take that break for five minutes and I will take five minutes to make up, make the questions up and then we can get done with it as soon as possible. It, it, it will not take us more than 10 minutes. Okay, it will not take us more than 10 minutes to discuss five questions. Okay, one second.
Okay, so are you guys back from their from your break? Are you guys back from your break? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our um what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our discussions on questions. Okay, good. So what we're going to do is back to the fact that I will ask you guys to unmute yourself and feel free to let me know the answers so that I can discuss and save us some time by going back and forth. See who answered what in the chat box. Okay, first question. Okay, so this is a you world question. Okay, what's happening over here? Was the first thing that we will do is we will read the last part of the question and then we will read the answers and then we will go back. Is everyone ready? Hoping everyone is ready. Okay, let's start. Yes. Which, of, which of the following structures is the most likely source of the breeding? Okay, so there are structures, breeding vein, germinal matrix, MMA, sagittal sinus, vessels of the circular root. This question is perfect because we just studied about this today. Mm, yeah, man, matrix. A four day premature infant in the neonatal. Okay, so we already have an answer. Okay, so what is the answer, guys? This should not be very easy. Uh, this should not be very hard. Yeah, it'd be. Anyone else? B. Okay, do we have anyone else saying A or C? Okay, good. So, does everyone agree on the answer being B? Yes. What, what is yes. the name of the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis? Inter, um, you need Interventricular hemorrhage. Oh, Interventricular hemorrhage. Very good. And the percentage of the population. Uh, who answered this question correctly was 42 percent so it's a pretty difficult question i don't know why okay it's pretty easy for you guys okay so that's good okay okay this one is uh okay this one is a question in two parts okay so first we read this part and then we will move on to the second one okay 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 so further explanation Further exploration shows complete transaction of the nerve indicated by the arrow in the image below. Okay. Okay, so this will test you guys for your brachial plexus. Can everyone draw the brachial plexus, which I asked them to draw very quick? Please, so that we know that we are doing the right job. Okay, please draw the brachial plexus. I asked you guys to um, draw in 10 seconds when you receive a brachial plexus question so that you guys are never wrong. After you guys are done, let me know. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, is everyone done? Yes. Texas? Everyone. Do we have? Yes, to? yes, there. Okay, doctor. So we're we are done with the we are done with the brachial plexus. Now let's read the question. The question was: the 23 year old man is brought to the emergency department after sustaining stab injuries. Okay, the patient feels lightheaded and dizzy. His blood pressure is 100 by 60. Physical examination shows bleeding from the wound over the left neck and shoulder. Intravenous fluids are administered and the blood transfusion is initiated. Uh, urgent surgical exploration is performed and the injury, injured blood vessel is repaired. Further explanation shows complete transactions of the nerve indicated by the arrow in the image below. Okay, so what is the name of this nerve that is damaged? Radial. 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 Okay, next part of the question. Which of the following actions is most likely to be weakened? Extension of radius. Of, of rest. Uh, please tell me the um, C. answer option. C. Okay. Extension of rest. C. What is the answer? C. 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 The, answer is, the answer is C. C. Okay. Did I hear anyone say B or D? No. I think I must have heard. I think I must have heard wrong. Okay, this is my problem. Because... Okay, not my. Okay, not your problem. That's my problem. Good job, guys. So it's C. Okay, good. Next one. Next one is what we're going to do is this one over here. One second. Okay. 
<clears throat> so right now, instead of uh, me, you guys will read it and you guys will tell me the answer. It's 138 on the clock. I want my answer by 139, please. 139. I have taught you guys how to read questions and do your answers. So right now it's on you. What is the answer? Well, I'm talking about What is the answer? You do not have a lot of time. Okay. Smile, my year sloop. Okay, C. we have one answer C. And anyone else? Anyone else? No, what? Is it B? Lateral like genicular nucleus. Lateral Yeah. Okay. Is okay. So, does anyone want to answer E? Opticism. Right. Okay. Yes. Maybe. E? Me. Okay. So, why why do you want to answer E, please? Uh, because um, light, mm -hmm. the light reflex is impaired. Right. So what's happening over here? You know, you have the light with when the light is shown in the left eye, both pupils constrict. So the, there's nothing wrong with the left-sided uh, optic tract. Okay. But what happens when you shine the light to the right eye? Okay. Her pupils dilate, meaning that uh, meaning that the light is not reaching the, the nucleus. And what is the structure that is responsible for lack of light reaching the nucleus? Optic, optic and sensory. What is the answer? Optic tract. Is everyone, does everyone understand? Yes. Did everyone understand? Dr. Hassam, Dr. Adenov? Yes. And every not other really. Time? No, not really. Okay, if you don't understand the question. Okay, so what's happening over here is, so you have the uh, visual pathway. Okay, we have this small visual pathway as you can see over here. Okay, and this is the. So if you have this visual pathway over here, okay. So if you if you shine the light in one eye, what happens with the uh, pupillary light light reflex? This goes all the way and then it uh, goes to the uh, edinger westphal nucleus and then it comes back to the oculomotor nerve, which results in pupillary constriction. Right. So this all happens because at first the light goes through the optic tract. But what would happen if the light does not go through the optic tract? If the light does not go through the optic tract, the patient cannot even sense that there is a light coming. As a result, the edinger westphal nucleus and the oculomotor nerve will not be uh, stimulated. And as a result, the pupillary constriction will not take place. So the, the patients with optic tract damage, okay, maximal or minimal opt optic tract damage, they do not have pupillary constriction when light is shown in the eye. As a result, their, their pupils remain dilated. Okay, it's not frontal eye field because frontal eye field damages will, will result in paralysis of the, um, uh, will, will result in deviation of the eye towards the opposite side of the paralysis. It's not lateral genicular nucleus. Okay, it's not Mears loop either. And optic radiation is not the one, visual cortex, because the patient does not have any signs symptoms of ischemia, okay, or macular sparings. The patient only has pupillary, pup uh, right, absence of pupillary reflex. So the oculomotor nerve is intact, but the optic tract on the right side is not intact. As a result, the structure is optic tract, which is damaged. Are we clear? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, can you tell us how should be the question if it has to be B, like the lateral geniculate nucleus? Why is this not B? No, no, how, how, how they had to ask us that we said, okay, it's a lateral genicular nucleus, so what would they change? Like, if you have a lateral geniculate nucleus, if lesions which involve the lateral geniculate nucleus can produce a contralateral homonomous hemianopia. If you have a patient who has contralateral homonomous hemianopia, but the light reflexes are normal, okay, with normal right lift, with normal right. I mean, light reflexes and um, 
contralateral hemi-normaltamian or homonormaltamian opia, then the lesion is in the lateral genital nucleus. Is that clear? Okay, I, if it's not clear, you do not have to worry because we have not discussed this as of yet. We will be discussing this in the uh, visual chapters of neurology. It's coming in future. Okay, so next week, hopefully. Well, thank you. Okay, you are welcome. Next one. Okay. Which of the following is likely to be seen during the nerve injury? Okay. So deviation of the protruded tongue, hoarseness, impaired taste, general sensation, reduced salivary secretion. A 66 year old man develops transient painless vision in the left eye, vision loss. He has a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. E evaluation reveals significant stenosis of the internal carotid artery. Okay. Over here, first of all, read the last question, then read the answers, and then we have to underline the important one. So history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes mellitus, that diabetes mellitus, and un un underline this, transient painless vision loss, underline this, because this shows that there has been an, an emboli, okay? Significant stenosis of the internal carotid artery, okay? During the surgery, the left glossopharyngeal nerve is accidentally transected. Which of the following is likely to be seen? What would happen? What is that? The loss of general sensation as a tonsillar line. Yeah. Everyone is, uh, ev does everyone agree with D? Okay, so the answer is D, loss of general sensation at a tonsillar lining. Very good, easy question, easy answers. Okay, so last question. Okay, so we were supposed to do 10 questions today, not five questions. Do you guys want to do five more questions? Yes, yes. <laughs> And we can do five more questions. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we can do five more questions. Okay. Uh, but let us finish these five questions first. Okay. Okay. The patient, this patient most likely has an injury involving a nerve that courses between which of the following structures? Okay. Do we have biceps and coracobrachialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum superficialis, <laughs> or the and medial epicondyle of the humerus, and supine muscles? Okay. Okay, so you have read the last line, you have read the answers, now you can read the question. A 45-year-old woman is evaluated for numbness and tingling on the right hand. That started two months ago, okay? Okay, how about I let you guys read it and let me know the answer. Okay, it's 146. I want the answer to be done by 147. I have, And to be honest, I have discussed about this. So it's very easy. The first thing it's which you see D. Do is, D. Hmm? D. It's medium now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which nerve is injured when you have fracture of the medial epicondyle? Ah, uh, that's why it's C. Because D is because D is But I think I think it's C. C. Has to be C because C. Because, because FDB is uh, innervated by median. Okay, good. Dig it. Median. Okay. okay, so the answer is C. Okay. Uh, answer is C, not D. D is um, D is not the answer. C is the answer because C is the answer because in C you have the nerve, which is median nerve, which is going through. Flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus muscle. Okay, and that nerve is the median nerve. Okay, that nerve is the median nerve. Okay, with that being said, we are done with our five questions for today. And uh, although we know that you know there there is some there are some of you who want to do five more questions. I know there are more of you who do not want to do any more questions. Okay, so I do not want to force you guys. Okay, so it's Friday. And uh, we are we are we have gone way way past our uh, lecture timing. Okay, our lecture should have ended by at one, but it's one forty eight. So is it okay if we end the lecture over here for today, since it's Friday? Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. There. Okay. So that being said, we are going to end our lecture over here for now. Okay. And, uh, okay. So advices for your Friday is. Um, Okay, so the thing is, you guys have to study for a long period of time, 
and I mean for a for a long hour of the day for a long period of time. So my advice to you guys is take your weekends very seriously. Okay, so the only way where you can um, the only way where you can do good in your weekdays are only if you take your weekends seriously. By that I mean, please do not try to study on your weekends. Okay. Try to do something else, try to watch a movie, try to sleep, try to eat, try to go out with your friends, try to spend some time with your family, okay? you uh, Being a physician is hard on everyone because uh, you do not get a lot of time for a lot of people. So now is the time, the weekend, okay? Go outside, have fun. And uh, we will also skip out on a self-assessment exam for this week. Do you, uh, but the thing is, I, I personally want to do a self-assessment exam. So the, can we do a small self-assessment exam for this week, okay? We won't give you guys a lot of questions. We will give you guys uh, around, 10, or around uh, 10 to 15 questions. Okay, we will give you guys around 10 to 15 questions. And this will be regarding our previous chapter that is musculoskeletal uh, and uh, connective tissue and skin. Okay, it will not be about uh, nervous system. Okay, and the reason why we do self-assessments is because we need you guys to do good in the exam so that we know that you guys are confident to move forward. Okay, so this uh, Sunday, I mean, day after tomorrow, you guys can give your self-assessment exam. It will take you around 15 to 20 minutes at max, and you guys can spend the rest of your day having fun. And um, on Monday, hopefully, you guys can come and uh, join the lecture again. And uh, by the next week, for sure, we would be done with our neuro ne ne neurology. Okay, we would be done with our ne neurology. And... Um, once again, we would highly, highly appreciate if you guys can finish your transactions for next week by Monday, because what this does is this allows us to uh, send out the links on time. Okay, that is, and that is why at times on Monday, it takes us some time to send out the links to everyone properly, because we have a hard time deciding uh, who will continue, who will not continue based on uh, their transactions. And also if you have a problem with finishing the transactions by Monday, all you have to do is let us know, send us an email saying that you need uh, extra time for this week and we are more than happy to provide you with extra time. Only if you are willing to continue and uh, complete the transaction by this week, we will allow you extra time to complete the transaction, but please let us know that you need that extra time or else we will not be or else we will not be able, uh, able to um, help you guys out, okay? So whoever finishes the transactions and uh, lets us know if they need extra time, we'll get the Zoom URLs. And um, hopefully we hope each and every one of you will stay with us. Please let us know if there's anything that you would like for us to do. Uh, if, there's, if there's anything you would like for us to change, if there's any feedback, please uh, uh, give us a proper feedback or rating on our page and Facebook. And with that being said, if you have any friends or colleagues who wants to come and join our lectures, they are more than welcome to do so, okay? Tomorrow's, a, uh, next week's a new week, okay? Uh, every week we let new, stu new students in and we are going to keep on doing this for, for the end, uh, till the end of uh, this month because after, the, after this month, our, uh, our, um, we, we will be starting our last month for first aid Okay, uh, we would, after, the, after this month ends, our last month for the first batch of students will end. And hopefully by then first grade will be over and then we will start all the chapters again for all the students who has missed out on the previous topics. Does anyone have any questions reg regarding our lectures? And about the students who wanted the videos, do not worry, we, you will get the videos very soon. Does anyone else have any questions for us? Yes, we will send you guys requests on PayPal uh, we have some students who use Venmo. We will use Venmo, so that we will send it right away. Okay. Any more questions? Um, sorry, uh, for oh. the, like uh, not not the last question, the previous question um, with the glossopharyngeal nerve. I mm -hmm. thought it's A, and I still confused. Like, so, sorry for so many questions, Doctor Diary. No problem. One second. Okay, deviation of the protruded tongue towards the left. Which nerve is involved for moving the muscles of the tongue? Because I thought it's the glossopharyngeal nerve, except the palatoglossal no, nerve. Ah, uh, ah, uh, now I got it. I got my mistake. Sorry. No, no problem. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for clearing out your confusion. Okay, so that's what it was. Okay.
Okay, any more questions um, from anyone else? Okay, perfect. So we have no more questions for this. And uh, okay, so I want to thank you all. Okay, Dr. Lala, then we have Dr. Adhanom, Dr. Nikki, okay, Dr. Dahlia, Dr. Kurbasi, Dr. Hussein. Okay, I hope you guys have a great week. And to every one of you who are who have attended and will attend this lecture, who are watching the videos, thank you to you too. And hopefully see you guys on Monday. I will send you guys the request right away. And um, please let me know if you have any questions regarding our lectures. We will uh, answer it via email. And also uh, we will send you the lectures very soon. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great day today. I will take my leave now.